Good morning. It's a great pleasure to me to open this conference devoted to multi-level governance and children's rights, challenges and achievements in the EU Italian Spanish context, theoretical and practical perspectives. This conference is the final step of a two years project led by Aida Kisunaite, supported by the University of Padua under the STARS Grants Program uh, entitled Mainstreaming the Children's Rights and hosted by the Department of Political Science, Law and International Studies. Children's rights protection is at the core of the human rights paradigm and uh, it is also regarded as a highly relevant purpose uh, of European Union. Ursula von der Leyen has maintained that for the European Commission is a, a crucial challenge, the creation of a comprehensive EU child rights strategy. And it is a priority for her mandate. So the research has focused on children's rights in the European Union, a normative framework and in European Union policies, in particular, with particular reference to the European Union framework and two member states, namely Italy and Spain, and uh, uh, in two subnational sub regions, Veneto and Catalonia. So the puzzle that has been put in the flyer of this conference is quite meaningful to, to give the, the main message of this uh, of the research and of this conference because uh, the, the analysis that has been developed has not only pointed out that uh, uh, there is a gap or maybe a gap between the recognition of rights and their effective protection and implementation, but it has also uh, addressed children's rights into the complex frame stemming from the reference to the EU multi-level governance that means the development of European Union policies at three levels, the supranational level, the national level, and the regional or subnational level. So is multi-level governance a limitation or an added value of European Union policies in this field? Does multi-level governance support or endanger mechanisms of child rights mainstreaming and intersectoral policy coordination? Could we even identify a coherent strategy in protecting children's rights? So these issues have been tackled from both theoretical and practical perspectives. And so this final conference is uh, aimed to do. And today in this closing event, thanks to the contribution of scholars, officials, and practitioners, all of them expert in the field, we have uh, the opportunity to share and discuss the main results, main outcomes of this project. So let me now thank uh, Aida Kisunaite, principal investigator of the project, all the research team. Uh, we have today with us uh, Dario Panebianco, Matteo Tracchi, uh, Mark Grau Grau, Simone Delicati, Maria Fernandez Arroyo, and all the distinguished speakers uh, uh, I am going to introduce to you. I also want to uh, warmly thank uh, the Universitat Internacional de Catalunya in Barcelona, with which uh, AIDA has cooperated during the research, and the Human Rights Center of the University of Padova, which help has been very precious in uh, all the path of this research. So I want to wish a fruitful conference and uh, I am very glad to leave the floor to the third speaker, uh, who is Caterina Kinnici. Caterina Kinnici is a magistrate and a member of the European Parliament since uh, 2014. Uh, where she is vice chair of the committee on budgetary control and member of the committee on civil liberties, justice and home affairs. She is co-founder and co-president of the European Parliament intergroup on children's rights. So thank you for being here. Thank you for 
for uh, speaking and please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank the University of Padua for inviting me uh, for organizing the conference on such uh, an important issue which uh, deeply involves me. Uh, first, uh, as a juvenile judge uh, and uh, then as uh, head of the Department of Juvenile Justice uh, of Minister of Justice in Italy, and now as a member of the European Parliament and the co-chair of the Intergroup on Children Rights, really the protection of children has always been representing one of my priority. And the main purpose of the intergroup on children's rights is exactly to put the right of children at the, the top of the EU agenda and to enhance them in the most diverse and the transversal issues and EU policies. We know that, uh, as uh, clarified by the Italian Constitutional Court, the European system of protection of fundamental rights, including the European Convention, uh, Convention of Human on human rights, and especially after the Treaty of Lisbon, you know, is a multi-level system ruled by the principle of the best level of protection. Among these fundamental rights, whose best protection shall be ensured by European and national judges, judges also the rights of the child are full, fully included. As, clarify, as clarified also by the Italian Court of Cassation, in fact, the principle of the best interest of the child is a primary value, resulting from the intersection of national, international, and supranational sources. As a benchmark of, uh, for EU legislation and action to protect children, a fundamental rule uh, is certainly applied by the United Convention, uh, Nation Convention on the Right of the Child, whose 30th anniversary was uh, we celebrated uh, last year. The convention with uh, is uh, four pillar, the principle of non-discrimination, the principle of the child's best interest, the right to life, to life and the development of the child, the right of the child to freely express his or her opinion, recognize everybody, every boy and girl as um, autonomous right holders. So thus Article 24 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which represents the main point of reference at EU level on this issue and enshrine the right of the child, the right to protection and care, the right to freely express her or her views and to have such views taken into consideration the right to parental relationship and once more the principle of the child's best interest that must be a primary consideration in all public and private action relating to children. Especially in recent years, several legislative acts have been adopted and action taken at EU level, which aim to realize children's well being as provided for in Article 24, both in civil and in criminal law. Right now, the European Parliament Committee on Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs is considering a proposal for a regulation regarding the use of technical tools to detect and remove child sexual abuse online, which represents one of the most serious and unacceptable violations of children's fundamental right. This is a very urgent issues because of the dramatically alarming figures. Reports of child sexual abuse online concerning the EU sharply increased and in the last decade. And the COVID-19 pandemic has made the situation even worse. That's why the intergroup and myself personally have demanded for a strong, ambitious and brave action at EU level to stop this phenomenon through a multidisciplinary and a multi-sectoral approach. 
Last July, the Commission presented an EU strategy for a more effective fight against child sexual abuse, both online and offline, whose main point are effective implementation and the development of EU legislation, improvement of preventive measures and of assistance to victims, enhancement of law enforcement response, a cooperation between public authorities and the private sector, the creation of an ad hoc European Centre to prevent and counter child sexual abuse, as requested by the European Parliament in the resolution of 26 November 2019, of which I was co-author. The strategy includes a specific chapter regarding child sexual abuse online, involving two legislative initiatives, a temporary one now being discussed to allow providers of electronic communication service to continue their current voluntary practice to detect child sexual abuse in their system and a long-term one, introducing a mandatory obligation for online service providers to detect and report child sexual abuse material. The latter uh, represents a deep change, uh, given that the current legal framework does not require internet service provider to actively search for illicit activities. Remaining in criminal file, law filed, another recent important European instrument regarding children's rights is the Directive 2017-16, a, a number 800, on a procedural safeguard for children who are suspected or accused person in criminal proceeding for which I served as a rapporteur. The, the directive has laid the legal basis of a European juvenile fair trial whose main purpose shall be the re-education of children out of crimes whose social reintegration must be fully ensured. In this respect, the directive provides us for a series of rights uh, for the suspected or, the, or accused child. The right to be informed in a way that allows the child to fully understand and consciously participate in the proceeding. The right to legal assistance, the right to an individual assessment, essential for identifying the specific need of the child in terms of protection, education, training, and social reintegration. The right to liberty was the privation must be considered an extrema ratio and in case of the privation of liberty the right to a specific treatment. On the other hand, special attention is also paid to the right of a child victim of a crime in Directive 2012, uh, number 29, which recognizes child victim as a full holders of the right provider for in the directive itself. First, uh, first of all, the right to be heard and to, private, to pri provide evidence. Given that for underage victim to risk of so-called secondary victimization is higher, child victims are considered as a particular category of victim for whom specific measures are settled to ensure their protection inside and outside of the trial. In the implementation of the directive, the figure of the victim in a condition of a particular vulnerability has been introduced in the Italian code of a criminal procedure. And among the index of the particular vulnerability there is, is the first place, the age. Another category of a vulnerable children who deserve a particular protection is represented by migrant children, especially unaccompanied children. It is estimated that uh, as many as 30,000 children have disappeared once they arrived in Europe since 2014. The intergroup on children's rights has been extremely vocal also in this issue. 
Now, the Commission, the Commission has just presented a new pact on migration and asylum, which first of all reaffirmed that the best interest of the child is taken into account at all stages of the process. As uh, uh, regard uh, uh, unaccompanied minors, member state must ensure that the child is represented and assisted by a representative and the member state of relocation must take relevant measure without delay. In addition, the new legislation specifically set out that any decision to transfer an unaccompanied child shall be preceded by an assessment of his or her best interest. We still have in mind the dramatic situation in Greek Island and the Greek camps with 2,000 of ch children often alone, left in inacceptable condition. We must ensure that this never happen again. One of our main requests is the introduction at EU level of the figure of the voluntary guardian, the voluntary guardian for all unaccompanied migrant children, as provided for the law uh, 47 2017 in Italy. Coming to civil law, I'd like to highlight the regulation 2019-111 uh, on jurisdiction, recognition and enforcement of a decision in matrimonial matters and the matters of parental responsibility and international child abduction. According to Article 20,000 of the regulation, national court shall give the child who is capable of forming his or her own, own view a genuine and effective opportunity to express his or her view and shall give the due weight to the view of the child in accordance with her uh, or his age and maturity. Moreover, the regulation which will replace the previous one from August 2022 improved the coordination within the European Union in the field of international child abduction, setting precising timing for the return procedure. From a more general point of view, finally, the Commission is working on a new EU strategy on the right of the child, which will be presented in the first half of 2021. The strategy will provide the framework from EU, for EU action to better promote and protect children's rights, including the, route, the right of the most vulnerable child, children, children's rights in the digital age, the prevention uh, and the fight against violence, the promotion of child-friendly justice. Libby Committee will soon start working on a resolution of the European Parliament to point out the main priorities we want to see included in the strategy, from the end of any form of violence and exploitation to children, on investment on children, especially in education, as well as an effective participation in, of children in all the decisions that involve them. The strategy will represent the basis for future action at EU level for the protection of child. And I think that in the building of such action and policies, it is of importance also the contribution coming from a project and study like the one closing today, which give us a comprehensive overview of legislation, implementation and cooperation on children right so once more thank you thank you for this important initiative i wish you a fruitful uh, prosecution of the work of this conference and uh, i am sorry if i can't stay all the time because uh, of uh, a meeting with my committee in the european parliament too. thank you thank you again thank you uh, thank you and um, thank you for this, uh, this image and this framework uh, uh, dealing with the main principles which shape the paradigm of children's rights in European and international uh, dimensions and uh, uh, on the consolidated as well as new 
uh, initiatives at the EU level and the new strategy of the EU uh, Commission uh, to face uh, uh, some very uh, strong and severe violations of children's rights. So thank you. And um, thank you. Uh, I now leave the floor to Emilio Puccio. Emilio Puccio is uh, uh, the coordinator of the European Parliament uh, uh, Intergroup on, on Children's Rights. He worked uh, previously for the Italian General Consulate in Barcelona for the Office of Corporate Social Responsibility of the United Nations at the United Nations Global Compact and at Amnesty International USA. So thank you for being uh, here to share your uh, uh, expertise in, in this uh, uh, field. And um, just let me know that uh, uh, we are collecting the uh, questions uh, dealing with uh, uh, his speech uh, uh, right at the end of the speech itself, uh, because uh, this is uh, the preference of uh, Dr. Pucci. So thank you and please. Thank you very much for having me and thank you very much for inviting me. I, I'm actually, it's an honor to speak here after Mrs. Kinichi. She has already explained many of the things that are happening here in the European Union. Uh, I want to thank the University of Padova for inviting me as well as all the co-partners. So La Universidad Internacional de Catalunya, the Human Rights Center of the University of Padova. Thank you so much for having me and for organizing such an interesting conference shedding some light on children's rights and the importance of children's rights as fundamental rights within the European Union context. So uh, here I'll try to do something a bit different, let's say. I'll, I'll try to walk you guys through the details and how, you know, how do we work and practice within the European Union and precisely within the European Parliament when it comes to uh, mainstreaming children's rights in all policies and legislation. Again, you guys got already um, sort of a glimpse of what is happening right now from Mrs. Kenichi, who actually also made references to many important pieces of legislation that are now being discussed at EU level. So I will start by immediately giving you some sort of a picture of what is the intergroup on children's rights. Because I feel like sometimes here in the European Parliament and in the European Union as such, we use terms that are very much intelligible for us, but not necessarily very interesting or very much uh, understandable from the general public. So let me start by clarifying what the intergroup on children's rights is and what is my role as coordinator within the intergroup on children's rights. So as the word itself might suggest, the intergroup of children's rights is actually a working group, is a working group that gathers, it's a cross political and cross national groups of members of the European Parliament, MEPs. Uh, when we say cross political and cross national, that means that the European Parliament intergroup gathers within itself members from different political groups within the European Parliament, as well as representing different nationalities. For those of you who are not necessarily familiar with it within the, uh, par the European Parliament, the European Parliament works slightly different than the a national parliament, of course, because so the people representing the different member states, they are not sitting together. So you will see people from different countries, of course, being part of several committees of the European Parliament. And so the same thing we've tried to replicate within the European Parliament intergroup on children's rights. So in terms of structure, this intergroup gathers actually around 120 members of the European Parliament out of 705 after the, our Brit the British people left. Um, so basically uh, within, this, um, within these 120 members, we do have four co-presidents and six vice presidents representing the four biggest political groups of the European Parliament. So you might wonder how come there is an intergroup on children's rights and there is not maybe a committee on the rights of the child. In some member states, some national parliaments do have a committee specifically dedicated to the rights of the children. In the case of the European Parliament, I think the reason to not create a committee on the European Parliament itself specifically dedicated on children's rights is that to avoid that then, because how does it work in practice? So when you have several committees of the European Parliament, you will see that pieces of legislation and policy will fall under the competence of a certain committee, right? Instead, the idea for the intergroup on children's rights started because 
the, the, the biggest goal was actually to mainstreaming children's rights in all policies and legislation. Because of course, every piece of policy and legislation do have an impact on children's rights. Our starting point, in fact, is that children are fully fledged citizens. They're not, you know, people to be looked at, to be looked at in a paternalistic way, but we do think of children as active citizens and fully fledged citizens who are also rights holders. And as such, you should actually, of course, recognize and acknowledge that all of the children have a say and are impacted by the pieces of legislation that are, um, that are dealt with within the European Union. Also, the European Parliament is the only European institution that has been democratically elected by the citizens. So there's some sort of democratic and democratic and legitimacy in the European Parliament. And so it was just fair that as well, children's rights and child rights perspective was taken into account in all pieces of legislation that are legislated within the European Parliament. So um, as such, once again, we do work horizontally as Mrs. Kinichi was also referring to, to all committees of the European Parliament. Now, for obvious reasons, there are certain committees that are by nature much more involved when it comes to children's rights. Mrs. Kinichi herself, she is, for instance, a, a member of the Libe Committee, as has been said. So the Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs Committees, of course, has the committee leading in the fundamental rights and being children's rights themselves fundamental rights, it goes without saying that a lot of the legislation um, implemented and put forward in the European Union goes through uh, these committees that affect, of course, children's rights very much. So um, then, again, you might think that this is pretty much all, right? But, you know, what about climate change? What about the environment, right? I mean, you might not think immediately, you might not immediately make the link and the connection with the committee on the, on, on the environment. But yet, as you know very well, of course, climate change affects primarily children because what is happening now will affect strongly the future generations. So again, it's well in the case of the environment committee. So the interview on children's rights always try to bring the child rights perspective and the children's perspective and the work done and carried out by all committees of the rights of the child. Again, I think I'm very, I'm very happy to also share with you that in fact, the Intergroup on Children's Rights is the second biggest in the entire European Parliament. Like I said, gathers around 120 members of the European Parliament. So um, the main goal is to mainstream in children's rights and always taking into account that our starting point, our guiding start is always the uh, United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. And as already been mentioned before me, we celebrated last year the 30th anniversary of this important human rights treaty, which by the way has been the most ratified human rights treaties in the world history. So um, we get, we take a lot of pride in the European Parliament as well to say that we strive to increase uh, and encourage child participation. Once again, I said it before, the European Parliament is the only European institution that is democratically elected. So we, we, we immediately uh, felt within the European Parliament into group on children's rights that it was just fair that children themselves would be involved in shaping the policies and shaping the legislation, those very legislation that are having an impact on them. I mean, I'm sure you all have seen the amazing, enormous uh, movement, world movement that has been started by Greta Thunberg, the Swedish uh, high school, uh, high school um, kid, who was actually starting this hunger strike outside of the, of the Swedish parliament. And you saw the strength of the children. I have always say, you know, when, when people in general within the European parliament, but also outside say, oh, how can we involve children in policy making, I'm like, well, I mean, you like it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you allow it or not, this is already happening. Children are not asking your permission to do so. And again, I always bring the example of Greta Thunberg, who has been now speaking and sitting together with the, you know, with the highest level people in the entire world, with the most important decision makers in the world. Precisely in the European Parliament, Greta Thunberg has been invited already a couple of times in the framework of the Work and Environment Committee. So. We, are do, we do believe and we are very firm believer that in fact, once again, every time that we legislate and we do, um, we do pieces of policies that have an impact on children, we do have to give them a room, the floor, and we need to consult them. To give you another example, in 2017, when we first launched the um, online consultation 
all over Europe together with UNICEF and Eurochild to actually ask children, what are their expectations from Europe? What is the children want about Europe? In fact, the event was called the Europe Children Want. And after that, every year we celebrate around the 20th of November, where we celebrate around the world, the World Children's Day, we actually always invite children to take the floor. We always invite children to, to, to bring their ideas and their expertise and try and shape the policies that are put forward in the European Parliament. Now, I would like to tell you as well, how do we work in practice? Because, I mean, you might say, well, this guy is saying so many nice things that, you know, it's important to take into consideration the child perspective. It is important as well to bring always the child rights perspective, you know, pieces of policy and legislation. But, but how do we do this in practice? So I try to give you now a sort of an overview on all the activities that are carried out by the intergroup and how it is that we try to influence them, the decision makers, and how we do try to take this, this child perspective into account. So, as Mrs. Kinichi was referring to, you know, committees, the different committees of the European Parliament, they do legislate on certain areas that are competence of the European Union. As you might know, because that, among us, there are, of course, many students of law, there are certain areas of competence in, in the European Union that are exclusive competence of the European Union. Then it's actually much easier for us then to have a say, because everything that's decided here in Brussels does have a direct impact on all EU citizens. Then there are certain areas uh, that are actually of shared com competence between the European Union and the member states. The, the main case would be the one of migration, right? Is the European Union uh, sets the standards and the principles that have to be followed by the member states and then the member states have the of course the power to you know to shape their national legislation bearing in mind that the principles and values that are set by the European Union law have to be respected so then this brings me to the fact that of course we do intervene as as intergroup through amendments on all legislation, and legislation in the European Union would be either a regulation or a directive, but as well, we do have enormous power in the so-called soft power, right? I mean, those are legally binding instruments, a directive and a regulation. And again, I'm sure I don't have to go into details of what a directive and regulation is in this context as well, but we do also take advantage of the huge entire array of legal or non-legal instruments that the European Parliament has at its disposal. What are these tools, again? So uh, Mrs. Kinichi was referring to resolution. And again, maybe people who are not familiar necessarily with the EU law or not even the EU law or the EU jargon, because again, we use a lot of terms that, that are very easy to understand in the so-called EU bubble, but they're not necessarily intelligible from the outside world. So, I mean, the resolution, once again, it is not a legally binding instrument as such, so it is not a legislation as such. However, it has a strong political value and it sends a very, very, very important, strong message to the outside world. So in a resolution, the, te the normal text of a resolution would be where the parliament, because it is of course done on behalf of the entire European parliament, the parliament would identify certain key areas of intervention and will call either on the European Commission which, as you all know, is actually the, you know, it's the, it's the executive body of the European Union, and it's the institution that has the initiative power. The, the, it's the only institution that can actually initiate a piece of legislation. Then, so again, in the just the regular, let's say, template or format of this resolution, you will have the parliament calling on the commission, or sometimes calling on the, on the European Union member states. Because, I mean, let's remember as well that these parliamentarians are as well, you know, national members, national citizens of some of the members, of all the member states, right? So it is, it goes without saying as well that, you know, when there's a, when there's a resolution where you see that members of the European Parliament are calling on their colleagues in the national parliaments in the member states to actually, you know, uh, take action on and legislate on certain issues in certain areas, then, you know, again, it, this is not legally binding for sure. So there is not any enforcement mechanisms that can be taken in, in place when you know, the member states or the commission don't act on it. But still, once again, it sends us huge political messages because you know, these colleagues are calling on their colleagues in the European Union you know, member states. And so, yeah, that gives somehow 
a sort of um, yeah an, an incentive, let's say, to to push for action in areas that need to be clarified, that they need to be uh, better legislated. Um, and in my personal experience, as uh, you know, as coordinator of the Intergroup on Children's Rights, I've been having the huge honor to coordinate an enormous amount of resolutions. And then, you know, these resolutions actually have been proven to be enormously effective. Once again, despite the fact that they are not legally binding, then these resolutions have really indeed created a real action. And I'll give you a concrete example, because I like to be concrete as well. So last year, in 2019, on the occasion of the anniversary of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, as I briefly referred to before, the European Parliament put forward a resolution on children's rights as such. So basically, we identified key areas of intervention, once again, where, you know, where we called both the Commission and the European Union member states to take action. So it was a very much a very comprehensive piece of document, I have to say because it covered many areas. And Mrs. Kinichi was referring to some of them. So one of them, for instance, was the ending of forms of violence against children. Then another area was actually to protect vulnerable children. Who are these vulnerable children? Vulnerable children would be, for instance, children with disability or would be LGBTI children. Because again, when we talk about children, it's from zero to 18. I know that a 17 year old uh, boy or girl would never be, she would, he or she would never like to be called children or a child, right? But, you know, that is what it is legally, because we stick to the definition included in the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, you know, again, so vulnerable children would be LGBTI children, or they would be as well children of LGBTI parents, because, I mean, you might, of course, not think about that, but what happens in certain member states, for instance, there are you know, there are parents of the same sex parents, right? They can adopt a child. But then this very child might not be recognized as the child of the same sex parents in another member states. And then you see that it's actually where, you know, where the confusion starts and where we do need an action. So I always give this example because this is the typical example where family law, it's family law, it's specifically exclusively competence of the European Union member states, right? So we, here in Brussels, sitting in Brussels, in the European Union, we do not have the power legally to legislate on certain matters that are exclusive, exclusive competence of the member state. However, and I'm, I'm giving this example again because I want to give you a concrete example of what, how we can actually influence always, anyway, even if we don't have the, the legislative power. As I said before, what, is, what happens in the case in which two parents, two same-sex parents adopt a kid? So because here in Belgium, for instance, where I live, same-sex people can actually get married and also they can adopt, right? So what happens if then this couple has to be sent to Warsaw in Poland because of workerism? I mean, Poland, for, for people maybe who not know, you know, Warsaw has the Frontex agency. So the Border Safeguard Control Agency of the European Union actually is based in Warsaw. So it might be a case where, you know, a same-sex couple, one of them get a job in Warsaw in Poland. What does it happen then when they go there and they have to put the kid in school? According to the Polish government, two same-sex people cannot have children. So they will always ask for having a mother and a father. So what does it happen to these children? Fine, it is true that this is not an issue that is actually competent to the European Union. But, you know, one of the principles, in fact, one of the core principles of the European Union is freedom of movement within the member states. But, I mean, it doesn't take a genius to see that, you know, if this family is not allowed, I mean, not is not allowed, but if this family cannot safely, safely move to another member states where their, um, their paternity and their um, parents' rights are not fully recognized, that of course, that goes without saying that this is a restriction on the freedom of movement. And so we tackled about, we, ta we tackled this issue as well in the resolution, among other things, like ending all forms of violence against children. But also we talked about migrant children. Also migrant children are very vulnerable children. We talked about children with disability. We talked about access to education. Once again, education is one of the other topics that is very much exclusive competence of the European Union member states. But once again, our job is to basically identify principles and to always try to encourage a sort of a best practice sharing among member states. 
I mean, even this very conference itself is a great example of best practice sharing. It's a great example of cooperation among member states. I mean, we have people from the University of Barcelona, and then we have people from the University of Padua. Me, myself, I did Erasmus and I lived myself for two years in Barcelona, by the way. So that's also why I'm actually very happy to also have the possibility to interact with Catalan students or uh, students coming from, from Barcelona. Um, and again, this resolution then literally bore enormous fruits because on the one hand, we um, then the European Commission actually uh, responded to the call for action that was coming from the European Parliament. Because as I said before, in terms of format, we always call on either the European Commission or the member states, which both have, of course, the legislative power to take action in something. So, when we said in the resolution of the European Parliament back in 2019, we said we need to do more, we need to take specific action at legislative level to tackle child sexual abuse and child sexual exploitation. Well, you know what happened? That was back in November 2019. What happened is that September this year, the European Commission adopted the legislative proposal for a regulation, so a proper legislation, where, you know, it's calling, it, Mrs. Kimichi referred to that in her presentation, where we, they introduced a derogation on the e-privacy directive, so on another piece of legislation, to allow sev online services providers to continue to use technological tools to detect child sexual abuse material online in their network. So without going into too much into details on this piece of legislation, I just wanted to use this example to say that well, even when we intervene in a non-legislative instrument, such as a resolution, we do have the power to have an impact because this is a clear example where you see that something that we call on in our resolution in the European Parliament, then you know, motivated the commission to take action and deliver it in, on a legislative level. Still in this resolution of 2019, we did call on the, on the um, European uh, Commission as well to try and tackle the issue that I was referring to before of this so-called mutual recognition of uh, court decisions when it comes to parenthood and parents' rights, to allow as well people of the same sex to travel freely among all the European Union. So the bottom line and the basic point was that, you know, something that is recognized in a member state in terms of court decisions. So even if a member state doesn't have an, an equality marriage, for instance, it is necessary that at least recognizes the fact that these same sex people have, are married legally in another member state. So that actually this can give them the right to move from one member state to another and then honor the so-called freedom of liberty, the freedom, sorry, of movement that we all should enjoy as a EU citizen in all the European Union. And again, we said this in our, in our resolution. And then actually last month, the European Commission came up with something very unique and very uh, special for the first time ever. It came with um, a, a strategy on LGBTIQ rights where they are calling and planning to in fact introduce a piece of legislation that will make it easy to do the mutual recognition of court decisions. Now, without going too much into details on all the things that we included, because there would be a lot, but I just wanted to give you the example that even when as a European Parliament, we do not intervene in, resol in uh, sorry, with um, legislative measures as such. So with legally binding instruments, we do have at our disposal as well other instruments that might still have an enormous impact as I explained to you before. So um, also, I just wanted to say that um, for the first time ever, we, the European Commission, and I think um, the moderator has referred to that in her, in her presentation, in her introduction, for the first time ever, President Ursula von der Leyen has actually tasked a European Commissioner, well, in this case, actually even a Vice President of the European Commission, to come up with a child rights strategy. That's, it's honestly historical because never before any Commissioner, not even a Vice President, has been tasked with this important role to actually put forward a resolution sorry, a strategy on, on children's rights. Um, this, um, this strategy uh, has already been announced by the vice president of the commission uh, and it will cover four pillars. I just wanna make sure that I said them uh, specifically very well. Just a second, yes. So um, the vice president, uh, Schwitza, Dubravka Schwitza, who is responsible for drafting this uh, important child rights strategy, which by the way, will be put forward around March next year, will cover four pillars. 
And those are the rights of the most vulnerable children, the children's rights in the digital area, the prevention and the fight against violence, and the promotion of child rights of child-friendly justice. You will see that those very pillars are actually also the result of what we called for in our resolution, the European Par Parliament resolution back in 2019. So once again, you see how we very much work hand in hand between um, EU institutions. So the Parliament and the Commission, we do enjoy a very good relationship, of course, with the Commission. As well, I really want to say here that the Intergroup on Children's Rights uh, and myself as a coordinator, my role is as well to make sure that the, what we do in the European Parliament is somehow as well the result of the constant cooperation and exchange of ideas as well with civil societies and academia. And actually, I very much take this opportunity to say that maybe like this after this, pres after this presentation, this conference, maybe we will try to cooperate more as well in the future because at the end of the day, people working uh, in the civil society in other nations or people like you guys, the academia, you do really work hands-on and you do really have the expertise. And I feel it's just fair that for decision makers, we do try to get in touch with you working outside who do have the expertise and then you do have the right to influence and inform the decisions that are taken as well. Even that those decisions, especially when they become legislation, do have an enormous impact on the lives of citizens and children. So, um, Again, another, another way in which we intervene and we work to make sure that children's rights are always fully respected within the European Union is through the amendments. And how do we do these amendments? So like I said before, um, besides the resolution and besides as well the reports coming from the parliament, when there's a piece of legislation, every piece of legislation that we identify, and again, it doesn't have necessarily to be immediately connected to children, because sometimes the connection to children is not immediate. But, and that's why I gave you the example of the climate change, when you see, why would you have to think of children in the climate change? This is a something to do with that something else, right? But uh, we do intervene with amendments. So what we do is that, and that's actually the strength that we have as intergroup to influence, because when there's a piece of legislation or when there's a policy, everywhere in every committee of the European Parliament, we would prepare some amendments. I mean, me, myself, as an advisor, I would have, my role is actually to provide my members with inputs and so certain amendments. And then once the members of the European Parliament that are part of the intergroup agree on those amendments, then they will co-sign. And so you will have then a bunch, a batch of amendments that is co-signed by 10, 15 members of the European Parliament belonging to different political groups. So it would be then impossible for the rapporteur or the, other, the person responsible of the parliament. Once again, you see, I use terms that I think are easy to understand, but maybe you would say, what is the rapporteur? So the rapporteur is the person of the European parliament, the member of the European parliament who represents the entire parliament in the negotiation of a legislation. So he's the, he, he, he or she is the person who is responsible of drafting the, the initial draft of amendments to the commission proposal. Because once again, always is the commission that does the first draft. So um, again, even when the European Parliament Intergroup or my members are not the rapporteur, we still have the power through the amendments to try to include a specific uh, vision or a specific perspective, which is always the perspective of children's rights. And then we, again, when, when this is co-signed by so, such a, nice, a large number of members, belonging to different political groups, it would be impossible not to be taken into consideration. Um, I think since, unfortunately, I will have to leave soon, I might stop here because I would, like, I would love to answer any question that is out there, because I think that's also the most important part, like to, to try and interact. Because we, in the European Union, you know, we don't get this chance a lot, unfortunately, to interact with people in the European Union member state. We are used to talk to each other and in the EU bubble. So I would like to use this opportunity to answer any question that you might have. Many thanks to Emilio Puccio for uh, this uh, rich uh, picture of uh, the, um, the main uh, European Union tools uh, to face uh, the challenge of the protection of children's rights. And, um, for having underlined the, the, the variety of tools, so soft tools, legally binding tools, and uh, for having underlined the four pillars uh, of this uh, European Union strategy, 
uh, and for having also um, told us uh, something about the uh, cooperation, the interaction between uh, European Parliament and uh, European Commission on this uh, uh, important uh, um, field and domain of action. So uh, I now um, um, go to, uh, to the chat because we have uh, several questions to Emilio Puccio. And the first one uh, is about the direct impact of the environment on children and their development. So the question for Emilio Puccio is, uh, uh, according to his experience, uh, uh, is there a, a, a direct impact of the environment on children and development and their development? So, uh, uh, is the question like the environment, as in, like, yes, the, so what is the impact of the environment on child development? Is that the question? I, I think so. I mean, the environment uh, in, in, in which children live and their development, I think. I think, but. If it is not the case, uh, I, I ask Natalia um, to, uh, to ask the, the, um, to have the voice because uh, uh, she has to ask the permission to, to speak. Anyway, I think this is the, the yeah, sure. interpretation. Um, as we as we said, um, as um, as I said, for sure, I mean, the environment does have an enormous direct impact on children. Not only maybe the impact might, might not be immediate, but once again, I mean, for sure, this is for sure, the world that we live now is a different world. I mean, environmentally speaking, is a different world than the world that our grandparents were living in, right? I mean, I remember, I'm sure everyone has heard stories like that. I remember my grandparents saying that even, I'm from Sicily originally, from the south of Italy. And I vividly remember my parents, my grandparents telling me that even in Sicily, in the mountains, there was a lot of snow. I mean, now we don't really have, we don't really get snow. I mean, in my lifespan, I think I've seen snow in Sicily just once or twice in a lifespan time. So we do have, I mean, the environment does, have an impact on children in the sense that that what we are doing now for sure will be then inherited from children and that's what we are trying to do once again when it comes to when it comes to environment and when it comes to climate change to try and take in the children's perspective and to try and do make some interventions that will assure that you know children living in will have um will have a direct um, I cannot see. They will immediately, um, I mean, we'll try to make sure that the children, of course, will live in the same level of um, prosperity that we, we lived in before. And so, and that is the case as well when it comes to, uh, to environment in terms of the climate change will create a number of so-called climate refugees, right? So there are certain areas of the world Unfortunately, most of the times areas that are outside of the European Union that are much more exposed. I think of many of the countries in Southeast Asia, for instance, that are much more exposed to, to the climate, um, the inclement climate change. And so, yeah, I mean, it's been estimated by many organizations in the United Nations that, you know, we are going to experience a lot of so-called climate refugees. So, and among those climate refugees, most of them would be composed by children. So once again, what we do now will really have a huge impact in the future and very much so for the children. Thank you. The second question uh, is about uh, uh, your opinion on the effectiveness of this European initiative to ensure the basic services for children in need. Once again, this is a very important question. And let me answer very, 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 very quickly on that. And I'll try to be as specific as possible. When we come to, again, access to services for children, this is one typical subject that is covered by exclusive competence of the European Union member states. So in theory, this is one of the typical areas where we as legislators in the European Union, we do not have any, any capacity, any say in this. However, 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 and again, when I say don't have any say is that unfortunately, this is not a subject that is covered by EU law. So there's no any, anything legislative that can be taken place that can be put forward here that has a direct impact on the social services in the, Euro in the different European Union member states. However, 
recently in the framework of the work of the Employment Committee of the European Parliament. And this has been actually very much as well, I have to say, uh, thanks to Mrs. Kinichi and people of the Italian Socialist Delegation. Now, what is important is that the European Union has created what is called the Child Guarantee. And I'm sure many of you might be aware of that or heard of it. And so in the Child Guarantee, there is actually specifically identified a specific, a specific percent, percentage of the European Union budget that has to be allocated to children, especially children in vulnerable situations, for instance, children that are now in institutions or children in poverty, because I mean, child poverty per se, it's unfortunate that we always think child poverty is something that involves children outside of the European Union, children in Africa, children in Asia. But did you know that 25% of the in child population in the EU is actually at risk of poverty? So, you know, and the, the thing, the, the horrible things about child, well, the horrible thing about poverty in general, but especially when it comes to children, is that unfortunately is a cycle. You know, a child who was born in an impoverished situation has a much less likelihood to then go to a good education, to then receive the right input, and then to access to university. And then it's again, it's a cycle of poverty. So this child, this child guarantee. And so to try and make an immediate connection with the European Union budget to this kind of services that even though we cannot legislate, at least we do have the power to make sure that a certain percentage of the EU budget is actually dedicated to this kind of situations in the European member states. And then the European Union member states have to use those resources to, uh, to those services and to boost the services to try and uh, mitigate the causes the root causes of child poverty. Thank you. The third question comes from an architect from Turkey uh, who is working on children's human rights. And uh, he or she, I'm sorry, I can't uh, detect this, uh, asks if you could give some info about European Parliament's projects about children's active participation to urban environment. Thank you for this question. This was a very important question and it goes in the right direction in the sense that, so once again, and I think you yourself said that Elena at the beginning of the presentation, and this is actually, it's very much the title of this, uh, of this conference, you know, the multi-level. To be honest, yes, I mean, urban development is very important in the sense that, you know, at the different level, you have the city council, then you have the regions, then you have the state, and then you have the European Union, right? As European Union, we try to also interact directly as well with the city councils and the municipalities themselves. And actually the city of Barcelona has been very much uh, enjoying this kind of direct, direct relationship uh, in a program with so-called with, um, uh, with the integration of migrants, for instance. So in the case of urban development, it's, it's, it's the same. So the European Union, once again, we don't have a, a capacity to legislate on something that has an impact on a city for sure. But once again, in terms of funds and in terms of, um, yes, yeah, so funds allocated and public tenders and public calls, many of the cities have been benefiting from those projects. And there are several projects that the European Union actually has in place and many resources that are available to, for development in urban areas as well improving the situation of children in urban areas. And the person asking the question was from Turkey. And even there's even actually projects that are also allocated for countries outside of the European Union. So it would be very important maybe like after this connection, I, I could try and, and connect with a person and try to direct people in the right direction. Thank you. A further question is about children with disabilities. Could you please mention a couple of actions that you have undertaken on the matter? Sure, once again, as said before, this unfortunately is not, um, is not an area that is speci specifically uh, covered by the European Union competence. However, so uh, recently, for instance, in the, once again, when we said in the, um, in the resolution of 2019, we included specific provisions on children with disability when it comes, for instance, to accessibility. I mean, I'm sure it is not uh, any news from you that in terms of accessibility, for instance, for children with disabled, for disabled children, it, the situation varies enormously from one member state to another. So um, as a matter of fact, uh, you, one of the court presidents 
of the Intergroup on Children's Rights is a Swedish member of the European Parliament who is actually a disabled person. Uh, and he himself, and I here actually also I want to quote him, he said that of course he had the luck to be born disabled, but to be born in Sweden, because you know the disability has never like has never um, limited him from achieving everything in life, which he did. Now he's even a member of the European Parliament. So, in terms of concrete action, I am afraid that once again I'm not going to be in the position to mention some specific action. But in terms of in the identifying principle and in terms of identifying, um, um, yes, principle and general, um, general uh, points need to be respected by European Union member states. We did that in the resolution. And as well, um, the European Commission has a lot of funds that, are, that have been allocating to, to increase accessibility. And as well, like, you know, when it comes to multilingualism, to the language of sign, to try and provide services that are also accessible to everyone. So the accessibility has been, I would say, the, the, um, the area where, the concrete area where the European Union has done the most to try and meet the specific needs of people with disabilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we are over with the questions. And uh, so now I leave the floor to the, uh, to the third uh, um, speaker, uh, who is uh, Adriana Ciampa. Adriana Ciampa is head of the unit policies for children and adolescents in the division of poverty and social program programming of the Italian Ministry of Labor and Social Policies, where she works since uh, 2002. Between 2009 and 2010, she was also responsible at the interim of the Division of Policies for Social Inclusion. So, please, Dr. Ciampa. Good morning to everybody. Uh, sounds well. Do you hear me? Um, and thank you for inviting me at this very interesting event to reflect on the state of art of children's rights in Italy. Um, after the last reorganization of competencies between different ministries, my point of view today will appoint to the governance of social services dedicated to the protection and the promotion of children's rights and to such operational project of important positive impact of, on uh, uh, vulnerable ch children life. My experience so must be read in coordinating way with my colleagues Stefania Conja and Alfredo Ferrante, which with we share the responsibilities to promote children uh, well-being in Italy. The first point I'd like to underline is the importance of a shared governance. The governance and uh, um, definition of the prior priorities of actions uh, lie in a constant and profitable confrontation with all the institutional stakeholders uh, with the support and the hearing of the non-institutional ones, children included. This led to a shared process right from uh, the um, planning phase of the intervention, guarantees and monitoring in progress, and the final evaluation based on uh, an effect effective taking in charge. Uh, to ensure this sharing uh, governance, uh, the tool adopted is the constant dialogue inside national coordination tables or social protection network with regional and municipal representatives aimed to adopt a sort of soft legislation and to define social programming, action priorities and operational projects. Um, particular attention has paid uh, in social programming uh, at the present time at the services and uh, um, practices uh, to support vulnerable parenthood, strategies and intervention for social and school integration, actions against uh, either economic or educational uh, poverty of children and families, and intervention for supporting young adults leaving the care system in the path towards autonomy. An important result of this shared action strategy has been the systematization of intervention addressed to children outside the family of origin through the publication of the guidelines for family foster care that cover topics such as uh, 
the different kind of foster care, the, reorgani the organization of the services, the planning and the regulation, the relationship with the judicial authority, the local best practices and the operative tools. The second one, the guidelines for the assistance in residential services for minors that are an updated tool of technical and political orientation in the field of residential services for children and adolescents, and they develop the multiple dimension, uh, dimension of care in residential services in the so-called family-like residential child care. And the third one, the guidelines for intervention with children and families in a vulnerable condition lied on the experience of the multi-annual uh, uh, experimental program uh, PP, Program of Intervention for Prevention of Institutionalization, and they aim to prevent institutionalization through parental support. The guidelines cover topics such as intervention for the care and for the protection of children inside their family environment, focus, focusing on uh, all the intervention aimed to prevent child removal from parents' care. The aim is to draw up an in operational tool able to coordinate models of intervention and to win the opportunities to help uh, children that live in vulnerable family environment. Some few sentences about projects and first of all about aforementioned PP project. To respond to child neglect problems and prevent child placement out of home, the Ministry of Labor and Social Policies and the University of Padua implemented the program PP. The, proje the project developed since 2011 uses a participatory method where practitioners are co-workers with parents and recognizes the parenting support as a strategy that could break the cycle of social disadvantage and ensure children a good life path. PP is a research training intervention program aiming at preventing child placement out, out of home by balancing risk and protective factors and focuses on supporting parenting through multi-professional and resilient based intervention with four kinds of tools, home care intervention, parents group, family helpers and cooperation between schools, families and social services. Another relevant tool used is uh, um, RPM online that stands for assessment, planning and monitoring, an online tool that allows practitioners and families to assess, plan and monitor intervention to respond to the needs of each child and of his family. Uh, the first implementation involved the 10 uh, Italian cities. Now the program reaches all the Italian regions and has been financed through the National Fund of Social Policies. The investment is uh, 4 million um, per year and has been involved a total of 3,800 families and 4,500 children to date. PP is strongly uh, child and family focused, giving children and their parents a voice and demonstrates the importance of an integrated approach to evaluation, planning and intervention with families. This kind of support model encourages the different departments, school, welfare services and so on to work in an integrated manner, the multidisciplinary equipe. Another project implemented in the recent year with some positive effect, effects is the, the, proje the project for inclusion and the integration of Roma children in collaboration with the Ministry of, Educa of Education. Uh, the European National Legal Framework of the project lies in the strategy for inclusion of Roma population 2012-2020. The project's uh, uh, purpose um, are to develop processes of inclusion for Roma children, to reduce their discrimination, to strengthen local communities by creating integration between school, families, children and social services. The implementation of actions have three core elements. The cooperative learning as an educational strategy, the empowerment of families towards school and local services, the strengthening of the capacity of the municipalities, the municipality to act through multidisciplinary and multi-level teamwork, and a change of expertise, expertise and practices at national level. Particular attention has been reserved to children aged from three to five with activities to promote their early schooling provision and to adolescents that are attending vocational training and are at risk of school dropping out. 
The project for a funding amount of 2 million for each year uh, has seen a constant and significant expansion of the territories and beneficiaries involved uh, over the years. Today, there are almost 600 Roma children and 73 schools involved through, uh, throughout Italy. Among the main outcomes, consolidation of the terri territorial network and an increase in frequency and school outcomes of more than 10%. Another important achievement in, uh, is the institution of the Care Leavers Fund, 5 million for each year, that address, addresses the adolescents that live out of home due to a legal measure um, when they become measure of age. The fund supports young boys and girls that live in residential services or foster care and that are unable to go back to their families of origin. The aim is to help them to reach a real autonomy, to continue their studies or vocational training, or to confront with the job market with an institutional and financial support for uh, at least the, the first three years. Uh, the National Care Leavers Project envisages a three years intervention to support boys and girls living care system. The pivotal point of the action and its main challenge is the definition of a personalized project whose preparation starts at the age of 17 uh, if the services assess that the boy or girl will not go back uh, home anymore. The boy or girl must be actively involved in the definition of her or his own project, which is a form of agreement with the local network of services and other informal resources that could contribute to support the path towards the autonomy. The boy or the girl will be supported by a coach or facilitator by, uh, for autonomy, uh, whose task is to facilitate the real implementation of each individualized project. The main support measure uh, is the so-called Borsa per l'autonomia, a monetary uh, grant for autonomy whose monthly value cannot exceed 780 euro per capita. Last but not least, Italy has introduced the Reddito di Cittadinanza, the new minimum income, as a measure to combat poverty, to fight poverty, inequality and social exclusion, uh, strengthening the job activation component. The inclusion income provides uh, an income support conditioned to the participation of beneficiaries to a tailor-made project agreed Upon by, um, upon by the families and the social services in case of households with multidimensional needs or the employment services in case of beneficiaries whose poverty is primarily related to recent unemployment. In the first case, the tailor-made project, so-called inclusion agreement, aims at promoting the social activation and the active inclusion of all the members of the household. This agreement designs clearly benefit from the experience gained through the PP program and of course in the construction of the uh, agreement, a specific attention is dedicated to, uh, the, to the activities directed to ensure the well-being and improvement of children, school attendance, uh, health and hygiene participation to social activities and contacts with peers, and at empowering parenthood. Today, uh, 1,300,000 households were involved in the measure. Those with the presence of minors are more than 500,000. Thank, thank you. Thanks to Adriana Ciampa for uh, having addressed the, the domestic, the national level in this multi-level framework uh, of uh, the uh, strategy uh, towards uh, children, uh, children rights and for uh, having informed us uh, about uh, the main initiatives, the main national initiatives uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Uh, as, uh, as I written in the, in the chat, uh, we would like to have uh, uh, questions and answers time at the end of the of the session, the morning session. So um, I now give the floor to the fourth uh, speaker, uh, Stefania Conja. Stefania Conja is head of the unit of social and work integration policies for migrants and foreign minors protection in the division of immigration and integration policies of the Italian Ministry 
of Labor and Social Policies, where she worked since 2010. She was official of the Ministry of Finance between uh, uh, 1992 and 1997, and official for the guarantor of, for the protection of personal data between uh, uh, 1997 and 1990, in, in 2010. So thank you, and uh, please uh, uh, have your throat, Stefania Conja. Good morning to everybody. And thank you for inviting me to participate in this conference. I ask some help to the organizer to show a presentation. I would like to dedicate my presentation to migrant minors, young people with migrant background and unaccompanied minors, all topics on which I have been working for many years in my administration. Uh, the first slides. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, considering the title of this conference, I tried to put the actors involved together just to show the real complexity of multi-level governance in our countries. And I'm sure that the, this list is not exhaustive. This slide clearly shows how many actors share the responsibility to protect minors and contribute to have an adequate system of guarantees for the best interest of the child. In the following slides, I will show you some relevant figures to better understand what we are talking about. And I will mention some policies put in place in favor of migrant minors and unaccompanied minors. So we are talking about almost 800,000 foreign minors present in Italy, and they represent the 22% of the entire population of non-EU citizen on Italian territory. That means that the average age of the foreign population is much lower than the native one, that is 16%. Uh, slide four, please. But how many of them are attending schools? Just under 700,000 that represent almost 8% of the entire population of students in Italy. The first citizenship is, as you can see, and then Tunisia. And that correspond to the presence of communities, foreign communities in Italy. Um, the next slides show you um, a very important number. Um, the 64% of foreign students were born in Italy and 37% are early living from education and training. We cannot really consider the foreign minor students born in Italy as migrants, because very often they do not know the country of origin of their parents and, and they do not speak fluently their language. That's why we prefer call them minors with a migrant background. Can you go ahead, please? Uh, this is an important slide that shows you how many uh, schools have a percentage very high for foreign minors in Italy. But uh, taking into consideration all the data that I have just mentioned until now, and the competence at regional level, the Directorate for Migration in to do in 2016, decided to work with regions to qualify the school system and to tackle the problem of early school leave, living. Can you go ahead, please? Okay, so the directorate um, worked with 19 regions um, that are 
have, that have been involved in project concerning the qualification of the school system. The region put in place 38 projects uh, that involve more than 200 schools, more than 300 local authorities, and that reached almost 30,000 migrant students in all Italy. Can you go ahead, please? Uh, these slides uh, show you the most implemented and innovative activities. And as you can see, learning or strengthening the Italian language remains one of the most important challenges. All the action, all these action uh, were financed by AMIF, so European uh, Fund for Asylum and Migration and Integration. Uh, another activity, please go ahead. Another activity I would like to share with you is the process that led to the creation of the National Coordination of New Italian Generation, named CONGI. As um, Mr. Pucci said before, the empowerment, the direct empowerment of people is one of the most important things. If, if we want to have a real dialogue and to understand the needs of people. So um, I think this experience is very important because and in, in 2014, we gave the association the opportunity to meet each other and to create a national network. In 2017, the coordination of association has acquired a legal form, wrote a manifesto, and became an interlocutor for all institutions. Um, the Congi now, nowadays, bring, brings together 35 associations, 5,000 young people with migrant background, is based in 15 cities, and the young people are speaking 33 different languages. Can you go ahead, please? Thank you. This is the manifesto and I just uh, underlined the main uh, themes that they decide to face in this manifesto, school, work, culture, sport and participation, citizenship and political representation, communication and international cooperation. Uh, can you go ahead? Thank you very much. In my opinion, I was saying this experience is, was very important to strengthen the empowerment of the new generation and give them the space to act and actively participate in the life of our country. Today, they sit in all um, committees, uh, national committees that um, are in charge of children and of migration. Uh, for instance, at the Ministry of uh, Education, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, etc. Uh, the third topic, would you mind going ahead, please? Thank you. The third topic I mentioned at the beginning regards uh, unaccompanied minors uh, that, as, we, as mm, they mentioned before, um, it's a particular vulnerable target uh, with very specific needs. According to the law, uh, we have some competences on unaccompanied minors, and in particular, we collect data on, a, on a, unaccompanied minors in Italy through an information system called SIM. We publish a monthly report on their presence and we publish even uh, uh, twice in the year a um, monitoring report on their uh, condition. We also have competences on family tracing, 
giving an opinion, a mandatory opinion on the integration of unaccompanied minors when they are turning 18 for the issue of the residence permit by the Questura. And we have competencies on integration policies. Can you go ahead, please? Uh, can, could you go ahead, please? I just talk about SIM. Okay, uh, these are the last data we published. Mm, so I think, as you can see, at the end of October, there are in Italy 6,227 unaccompanied minors, 96% are male, and almost 90% are 16 or 17 years old. The first nationality is Bangladesh, followed Follow, <clears throat> followed by Albania and Tunisia. Uh, to know very well uh, the presence and the characteristics of this um, particular vulnerable target uh, led us to put in place um, a specific policy for the minors turning 18 to uh, facilitate the integration in our society in a very difficult moment when they turn 18 and so they become, uh, they, in principle, they should become autonomous. Can you go ahead, please? So um, this policy and the inclusion of uh, unaccompanied minors turning 18, we have called it pathways percorsi. It consists of an individualized path that leads to an internship aimed at acquiring useful skills for entering in the labor market. Um, this line of activity was financed by uh, the social fund and at the end of this year, we have around uh, 2,000 internship concluded. Uh, sim very, very similar to Percorsi, uh, to Pathways, is another project um, we call POI. The next slide, please. Uh, POI means you can. And is aimed to refugees and former unaccompanied minors always through pathways that lead to internship. So this, um, I try to show you some figures and some policies that we put in place towards our target. And I, I'd like to conclude my, my speech um, trying to answer the question that Professor Pariotti put at the beginning of this morning. Uh, is multi-level governance a limitation or an, or an added value? Multi-level governance um, is, I would say, is a photography of the complexity that we need to put in place to, to guarantee uh, at the best, the minors. But I, uh, I'd say I had a dream. I have a dream. I really would like to have a legislation more coordinate. I really would like to have in our country a unique and organic code on children. Uh, in the last slides, if you can go ahead. Still have, thank you. I just put a paragraph of the action plan on integration and inclusion that together with the, uh, with the comprehensive strategy on the rights of the child will be the framework in which uh, all the actors in Italy will move in the next years, 
and uh, I hope we will be able to uh, to take advantage uh, from the child guarantee that the European Union is uh, setting up. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Stefania Conja, um, who has provided uh, a, a picture of the Italian uh, actions uh, for social integration policies, namely for uh, uh, foreign manners, and uh, for having uh, given uh, your point of view on the, the main issue, so which is the, the role, which is the, the impact of the multi-level structure of the uh, European Union uh, uh, strategy and European Union framework on social policies uh, in general. So many thanks. And now uh, I give the floor to the, the, the last uh, uh, speakers, uh, who is uh, Paul Marie Close a Spanish sociologist and politician specializing in the study of poverty and child poverty in particular. Between 2018 and 2019, he held the post of a Spanish High Commissioner for the fight, fight against child poverty. Since February 2020, he is president of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the Congress of Deputies of Spain. So now, our focus is on the national level and on the Spain context. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elena, for, for the presentation, for the introduction. Um, I would like to share my PowerPoint. Uh, is it possible to share the screen? It says, so far it says that the coordinator doesn't allow me to share the screen. Is it possible to share the, the yeah. PowerPoint screen? Uh, yes, yes, it is possible. You can try now. OK, thank you. OK, uh, I assume everybody can see the, the screen now, the, the PowerPoint screen. Is that the yes. case, Elena? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. It was. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this opportunity to exchange views about children's right, uh, rights protection in Spain, in Italy, at the European level. Um, I will start to walk, to to speak about what I would call a kind of transition to to a child's right friendly regime in Spain. You know, we have for a long time been a country that didn't pay much attention to uh, child rights in, at the policy level. Uh, we usually ranked uh, quite poorly in some of the comparative indexes that we have in Europe, in the Innocenti uh, index, for instance, especially we rank poorly regarding material and, and education indicators, much better when, when we assess uh, children's uh, emotional well-being and health. Uh, but there were many, and there are still many pending issues that require uh, urgent uh, attention, especially regarding high child poverty rate, high early dropout rates, lack of adequate uh, attention to violence against uh, abuse and neglect of children, need for better protection for unaccompanied uh, children. And when I say like high child poverty uh, rates or high early dropout rates, I really mean it. You know, uh, we really fare very poorly uh, in Europe uh, when compared to, to countries that are not as developed uh, economically, for instance. So, so there were many pending issues that required uh, uh, attention. Uh, in 2018, a new, uh, a new government came to power, uh, led by a left leftist coalition, 
well, at the beginning it was not a leftist coalition, but but beginning in 19, in 2019, it, it um, well, this coalition was formed, and uh, it has it has uh, shown a strong commitment to address these issues, uh, particularly uh, child poverty. In this sense, Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez often says that this should be a legislative term for the children. And Spain should become the best country to grow up. Um, and this is, this is uh, said uh, in party programs, but this is also said in, in the parliament very often. And this is something that I can assure you was not said uh, four years ago or in the last decade. You know, we didn't pay attention to children for many decades. You know, we were not concerned about uh, the fortunes of, 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 of children. So which are the commitments of this new government? Well, these commitments follow closely the recommendations of the last periodic review of the Committee on the Rights of the Child on Spain in 2018. There, you know, the committee, you know, pinpointed several issues that uh, needed to be addressed uh, urgently. And how has the government addressed these issues? Basically through, first, the creation of a high commissioner against child poverty in 2018, where I worked for nine months. Uh, and this was like a small office, basically, basically formed by, by scholars and experts on, on child uh, rights uh, that work very close to the president, that have a strong back backing of the president. So they work next to the president because, because even physically they, they, they work in the same building in the Palacio de la Moncloa, where, where the, the official residency of the prime minister is. Um, second, the government committed to improve the allocation of new net resources targeted at, at children or a, a child uh, specific programs, particularly uh, targeted at children more in need. Um, and that was first tried in 2019 when, when the government tried to pass a new annual budget, but was not successful. So it, it didn't gather enough support to pass that, uh, that budget. And then later, yet uh, right now in 2020, uh, um, they include many new resources for children in the 2021st uh, annual budget that will uh, probably be passed in the Spanish Congress of Deputies tomorrow. And you know, it seems that the government is going to have enough support to pass uh, this new budget. Third, uh, the government has committed to this new approach through new laws and strategic plans to strengthen the protection of children's rights. And I will only mention three, um, you know, big steps in legislative steps. So first, a comprehensive, pro comprehensive law on violence against children. Second, a minimum income guarantee with particular attention to child poverty, the so-called ingreso minimo vital. And third, a new general law on education. Um, the three of them are, uh, have been uh, are enforced and, uh, and are now uh, the project is, in the, is, is, is being debate in, debated in the parliament. So the High Commissioner Against Child Poverty, as I said, is like a small group of experts working uh, on, on these kind of issues. And it aims to inform about and encourage policies to address issues, uh, issues on poverty and social exclusion across government department and different uh, levels. So national, regional, a municipal level. So it aims at coordinating efforts at fighting uh, child poverty and more broadly, social exclu exclusion. So we are not strictly 
speaking about child poverty. We are uh, speaking about social exclusion in a broader sense. It also works to build a national alliances, alliance against poverty involving both the public and the private sector. So there is a strong effort made in bringing in uh, large corporations, for instance, in financing programs against child poverty or against the consequences of, of, of child poverty. So um, the main areas, lines of work right now is uh, strengthen the system of social benefits to support households with children, with additional support for families at risk of poverty, improve the provision of services for, for children at disadvantage with programs for children with learning difficulties, um, very often coming from, from like vulnerable backgrounds, program to fund access to, to leisure opportunities. So for instance, in, in summer, when, when, when you know, uh, poor children are often uh, excluded from uh, leisure programs. And third, address uh, digital gaps, which were um, you know, deeply felt during these confinement times uh, during, uh, provoked by, by, by the COVID contagion. So during these times, you know, it, it became very obvious that the, the low income children had often no access to computers and to, to, to digital co learning contents that, were, that are key for, the, for, the, for their learning. Third, I would say um, one of the, the primary goals of the commissioner is to gather better data on child poverty. And this has already been made through, through uh, you know, administrative data that give like a clearer picture of child poverty at the territorial level in very small settings. Contribute to, to assess the, nature, the nature of child poverty and risk factors. Improve budgetary analysis for the correct identification and tracking of, uh, of, of public, public resources for children. So basically, having a good view of how public resources are benefiting or, and to what extent they are benefiting uh, children. So there is a strong emphasis there, a strong focus on research, on uh, um, um, the, the basically the, the, the conditions, the living conditions of children and how they could, they could be improved uh, through public policies. The second line of work is budget allocation. As I said, we are about to pass the 2021 budget project, and there are general improvements in education policies and in programs against child poverty and its consequences. There is, for instance, a large increase in expenditures for children, for, for education, for especially childcare for, for zero, three-year-olds. Uh, to address social gaps related to the digital resources, uh, new programs for children with learning difficulties and uh, programs that can prevent uh, early dropout. There are res new resources addressed to social services and community-based programs against child poverty. So these resources have tripled in the last three years. Uh, there is 1.5 billion devoted to the minimum income guarantee. There is, there is a significant increase for, uh, in resources for housing policies with special attention to, access, to the access of families most in need. There are resources to cover health uh, co-payments for medicines for children at risk of poverty. And there are resources to address heating costs for low-income uh, uh, families. So this is a completely new paradigm, a new approach uh, um, when compared to the budget allocation of the last budget that we had, which, which was passed in 2018, we had many difficulties to pa pass budgets in the last two, two years. So uh, the governments failed in passing budget because they, they couldn't gather uh, uh, majority support in the parliament. And this 2021 budget will be the first one after 
you know, 2018, when the budget was passed by the former government, the, the conservative government that led Spain for eight years in uh, before 2018. Okay, uh, the another uh, strand or another line of, of, of work is this new comprehensive law of violence against children. Again, following the recommendations of the Committee on the Rights of, of, of the Child. Okay, so this law aims at encouraging good treatment and preventing violence against children, abuse and neglect of, of children. So this is a law that, that aims at fostering a new culture of, that puts emphasis on good treatment and prevention. So it encourages new programs aimed at preventing violence in the family, in school settings, in the community, in the digital world. So, you know, it opens uh, this, this uh, view towards no new spaces where uh, there was no legislative uh, development so far. So, for instance, like the, the digital world. It increases training and skills among professionals to raise awareness, to facilitate uh, early detection and treatment of violence against children, and it, it, it strengthens intersectoral coordination between different services that uh, work with children. It ensures accessible, confidential, child-friendly, and effective channels for, um, for, for, children's that, for, for children that need to denounce uh, any form of violence. It strengthens protection against instances of ill treatment of children in residential care centers. In the improves the protection of child victims during court proceedings. So, for instance, so basically, with the aim of preventing secondary victimization when the procedures led to, for instance, the multiple interviews of children, repeated interviews through times, medical searches, and, and so on. So, this gets simplified and uh, protects bet better these child victims against the secondary victimization. Last but not least, it ensures the periodic assessment of the outcomes of the law. So this law will be assessed every two years uh, with the aim of developing effective national strategies to address pending issues and to reshape the law if necessary in order to uh, well adapt to what are really uh, the needs that have, have have not been covered so far. So we also talked about this new uh, minimum income guarantee, the ingreso minimo vital. And the ingreso minimo vital aims at ensuring adequate resources and increased coverage uh, to address severe poverty across different regions in Spain. So so far we have policies at the regional level, you know, that provide minimum income guarantees. But coverage across Spain is very uneven, and there are many, many regions that have provided so far inadequate uh, coverage, coverage. So basically, well, not only inadequate or, re or very reduced coverage, but also um, in, um, uh, benefits that were often, um, well, quite, quite, quite uh, low. So at this, this time, this, this, this program will be linked to training programs aimed at encouraging the incorporation of the beneficiaries to the labor market. And, and this, is, this is particularly important for, for, for child, child rights. It pays particular attention to child poverty, particularly in single parent families who get a 22% supplement benefit to what other families uh, would get. So we also have introduced, so the government has introduced a new general law on education, which makes a very strong emphasis on equity and inclusion. Basically, it increases resources devoted to education, and uh, there is a commitment to reach a 5% of GDP expenditures threshold. It commits to expand childcare services, especially for low-income children 
uh, who, uh, who have often not had have the opportunity to, to, to be included in these in services because there were co-payments that prevented them from, 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 from enrolling in this, this program. It aims strongly to combat social segregation, preventing the concentration of disadvantaged children in public schools. You know, there have been, you know, uh, policies, hidden policies to prevent uh, some of these disadvantaged children uh, from enrolling in, in uh, publicly financed private schools. It forbids public investments in schools that implement sex segregation practices. And it ensures that children with disabilities have access to ordinary schools and ensures their allocation of human, technical, and financial resources to that purpose. So I finish with these slides. This sounds good. Uh, this sounds child friendly. But what are the general challenges and when, what are the pending issues? There are pending issues when you examine you know, the recommendations of the, the, the um, uh, Committee on, on, on Child Rights, um, or if you examine other, other recommendations made by, by international organizations or made by, by, by uh, uh, scholars, there are other issues that that have not been satisfactorily addressed so far. So for instance, there is a high number of foreign and unaccompanied uh, children. And there are every, every year there are huge waves of Moroccan children, North African children coming, coming to Spain. Uh, and it is quite obvious that it is necessary to improve the protection standards for them. There are uh, many issues, you know, uh, that have not been properly addressed. The government has expressed its commitment to, to work along this line, but uh, this is a pending issue so far. There is a strong need to improve the provision of housing at affordable prices for families at risk of poverty. There is a need to improve attention to children with disabilities through early interventions. And there is a high number of children in residential care and it's necessary to improve the provision of foster homes. These are pending issues, but the, the first general challenge is to make new measures and legislative initiative, legislative uh, innova innovations that, that have been adopted really work, really work, matching resources uh, to needs. And this is probably the challenge that we will have next year. You know, we are, uh, well, in difficult times, in, the, in turbulent economic times as well. And we don't know to what extent we, have, we will have a margin that we, we will need to uh, allocate record resources to these needs. Thank you very much. I'm open for discussion on, on any of these topics. Many thanks uh, to, to Pao Marie Close. And um, now uh, it is the time for questions or, and answers. I don't see any questions in, in the, oh no, I, I start to see uh, some questions or what? Um, Simone Delicati would like to ask uh, Paolo Marie Close what he thinks about the role of the European Union in relation with the protection of children at a national level. Is the European Union providing an added value to Spanish action in this field? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. It is a key question. You know, I couldn't mention, you know, all the lines of work, for instance, of the High Commissioner and the High Commissioner, for instance, has been deeply involved in the, in the work that the European Commission uh, is doing. Uh, and it ha had also, prior to that, it ha had also worked with, with uh, parliamentary, parliamentary members in thinking about the, the, the European Child Guarantee, um, 
which is, as you know, uh, it has been mentioned before by Emilio uh, Puccio, uh, allocation of, uh, you know, resources of the framework, uh, the, the, the budgeted, uh, budgetary framework to children and to the prevention of child uh, poverty in particular, but also to child education and nutrition, you know, but basically with this focus on social exclusion. And I think this, this, this work by the, at uh, the European level is very important in inspiring work that we do at the national level. You know, we have been deeply inspired by uh, discourses, read their, uh, discourses that were made at the European level, both at the administrative level, but also, you know, through reports, the joint reports on social exclusion and the focus they they put they they put put on child poverty or child rights or the or the 2013 uh, um, what was the name recommendations on on child uh, on children rights were key in driving you know efforts uh, at the national level you know and inspiring as you know a model to be followed and and you know uh, a source of information about practices, about policies that work, about policies that can be, you know, included in our in, in, in our agenda, and we have tried to shape as well this uh, this this agenda by by getting uh, deeply involved in this uh, uh, European uh, guarantee. Um, I think uh, it's key that this European guarantee gets approved. It somehow, you know, uh, at the European level, you can work in policies that have no immediate outcomes, uh, which is always much more difficult at the national level. When you are part of the government, you know, the leaders want you want to get reelected, and they want to see outcomes in a short period. Four years. You have four years to improve poverty. You have four years to improve uh, educational uh, outcomes, and this often doesn't work so 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 quickly. You need more time to do that. And the European the European Union provides has more time to implement policies. Like the budgetary framework is is wider, is seven years, and uh, you don't expect to see results you know, uh, immediate results, and you don't have the strong political pressures that you have at the national level. So, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions, and so I take the advantage to, to, to make um, a, a question myself. Uh, I would like to ask uh, all the speakers uh, about the, the problems uh, they have seen, they have detected uh, in uh, the initiatives uh, they have presented in their speeches. So, uh, following the, the order of the presentation, so I would like to start uh, uh, from um, uh, in, in Emilio Puccio, if uh, he wants to say something, but uh, above all, uh, Adriana Ciampa, Stefania Conja, and, uh, and Paolo Mariclose. So, which are the main uh, problems uh, these initiatives uh, have to, to face, uh, to, to go ahead and uh, to, to make the, their achievements? Okay, so uh, Emilio Puccio had uh, to leave the, the meeting. So my question is to, uh, to Adriana Ciampa first. Uh, okay, uh, she, she has left the meeting. Uh, Stefania. Thank you very much for the question. Ah, uh, the main problem, so I think the main problem is exactly uh, the main issue of this conference, to put together all the stakeholders 
that works on children's rights. Uh, I mean, with uh, migrant children, um, it's very difficult to work all the minister and regional level and local level all together. Um, when you have so many stakeholders, um, we know, I give you an example. We know that with migrant minors, we have a big problem of dropout at school. And we know exactly that we have a gap, for instance, with uh, the written language at school. But to put together all the competencies that you have with different funds uh, that you should implement uh, to face the, the problem is very difficult. For unaccompanied minors, um, we have different kind of problems. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to, to have forecasts, precise forecasts on how many unaccompanied minors will we have, I don't know, in three months. So it's very difficult to program intervention because you never know. Um, I give you another example. In 2016 and 17, we had more than 20,000 unaccompanied minors in Italy, and now we have 6,000 unaccompanied minors. That means that you have to uh, provide a system that is in charge of uh, different numbers. So, but you cannot pay foster care. Um, or um, a structure to host minor if you do not have man the, the number. Um, I try to be clear. Um, or for instance, now we are having um, my unaccompanied minors coming from the East Corridor, I mean, from Trieste. They are entering from Trieste. Three months ago, they were coming through Sicily. So you should put in place a system that is capable to give answer, different answer in different place, okay? And for unaccompanied minors, uh, the main problem are at the beginning when they arrive and when they get 18. So in a very small time, you have to put in place intervention that um, lead the minors to be autonomous in, in one year, in two years, and that's very difficult. Thank you. Paul? Yes. Um, well, I see problems at two levels. You know, my understanding of all this is, not, is broader because, you know, I am addressing, you know, uh, a large uh, body of fields uh, in which, you know, interventions can take place. Um, so I see a first problem is to make children's rights and, you know, the violation of children's rights visible and bring it into public attention. You know, particularly in countries like Spain and Italy. You know, this, this is, these are familistic countries, you know, that have largely demanded that families take responsibility for the needs of children. And you know, there was not the same sense as you can see elsewhere uh, in asking the state to take responsibility in uh, provision of services, of resources to address these issues, okay? So sometimes, you know, there is no expectation that public action will take place. And when that happens, you know, uh, it is difficult to prompt, you know, public authorities to, you know, uh, to take this, this kind of uh, proactive uh, um, uh, action or intervention. Second, the second problem that I see is to bring it into the political agenda. 
not only in the public uh, field, but in the political agenda. You know, in Spain for a long time, we, for instance, knew well that there were high poverty rates. You know, scholars knew it, knew it, um, um, social entities have known it for a long time. You know, international organizations were, you know, putting the focus on, you know, the problems of Spain regarding child poverty. Um, the Committee on Rights of the Children, you know, were in the uh, 2010 report were already saying, you know, Spain has many problems regarding the protection of children, right? But no action was taken. No action was taken. First, we, because, you know, the budgets were, were short. Um, you know, we were implementing austerity measures and there were budgetary constraints, uh, like quite, quite strict budgetary con constraints that prevented the possibility of introducing new issues into, in, into the, the agenda. At the same time, you know, these new issues, child poverty, uh, you know, dropout, uh, early dropout rates and so on and so forth, which, which are connected. Um, in social exclusion of children with migrant backgrounds, for instance, and so on, you know, were there, we knew that they were there, but at the same time, there was a reluctance by politicians to devote resources to issues that were not going to make them reelected in a context of uh, severe sh shortages in uh, public resources. So, you know, the, the, there is a challenge to make uh, politicians understand this, that these needs are important and are probably more important than other social needs that might be equally legitimate. You know, when a politician uh, needs to choose uh, what kind of need he will pay attention to, he will be facing competing claims for resources. You know, in Spain, they will be facing claims for you know, long-term care, pensioners, you know, employment protection for, uh, you know, older adults who, who, who lose their jobs. There are, even, even in the field of poverty, you might find homeless people saying, you know, the, the most urgent issue you need to, to address is this one. You know, uh, how we convince politicians uh -huh that children should be given priority, should, should come first in the list. This is one of the main issues, the main problems that we need to confront when we, uh, you know, think about promoting uh, child rights in the political agenda. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like also to ask uh, um, uh, Pao about uh, another, another um, maintenance uh, he, he made and uh, um, he said that the high commission against child poverty approach is completely new in Spain. Uh, is it new for um, because of the substance of the initiatives and of the actions uh, uh, which have been planned or is it new because of the, um, the procedures, the in intersectoral relations, uh, coordination uh, it's, it uh, involves, or which are the main reasons uh, uh, for which we can say it is a new approach? Well, both. You know, it's a new institution that was created in 2018, and there was previously no institution that resembles whatsoever to this kind of institution. It is new because it brings pre people from the academia, from the scholarly uh, field into politics to address issues they have expertise on. You know, this is, this is a completely new approach. You know, I'm a scholar, you know, I was not affiliated to the Socialist Party when I, I uh, enrolled in the, in the high 
commissioner. Now I am, but at that point I was not uh, affiliated. Uh, and most of my collaborators were, were not, uh, you know, uh, people who, who had any political leanings. Uh, they, were, they were progressive, but they, they were pr primarily scholars. Okay. Second, it's new because it works with a strong backing of the prime minister. Okay, I was like stressing that we worked at the same building as the prime minister. We had a strong backing of the prime minister with, which en enabled us to go to any ministry or any uh, public department and, you know, uh, enter the door and say, you know, we are representing directly, you know, the views of the president, the mm -hmm. prime minister. And so we were working at the, this kind of inter the, the interministerial uh, level, you know? We, we had the opportunity to work with all together to make people talk that had not talked ever before, you know? That, you know, worked in different, worked in different cells that never interacted. And we were this kind of agent that put efforts together, you know? And we went beyond that by putting together efforts at the public sector and at the uh, uh, private sector. You know, we we brought together the public sector and the uh, private sector to address issues at the local level, for instance, uh, the public sector at different levels, at the general levels of the government, at the municipal level, at the regional level, but also corporations that you know had social responsibility responsibility programs that could uh, you know benefit these communities okay so so you are right in this both uh, in in at this both uh, at these two levels you know on the one side it's a new institution but at the other side it was working with with a different uh, different procedures a different uh, style of, of, of working and with this strong backing of the Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, now, Aida asked uh, uh, to um, Paolo uh, about the regional differences in Spain regarding child poverty. Is there any difference and how is it possible to address this problem at the national level? There are huge differences uh, at regional levels and one of the aims, for instance, of this minimum income scheme, this, this ingreso minimo vital, is at providing a minimum, uh, a common, um, um, common, like a, a floor uh, income for every citizens, citizen around Spain. So this common floor can then be complemented by the regional authority, authorities. But every sp Spanish household will be entitled to the same amount of, uh, of money when they you know, meet challenges related to socioeconomic uh, vulnerabilities. Okay? So that means, pro that, that means for sure that uh, most of the resources will go to poorer regions where, uh, high, where poverty child poverty is much higher than, than in, in other regions. You know, there were also, you know, huge differences between the policies that were already impl implemented by these, these regional authorities. And that was the main reason the central government got involved, because children in the south of Spain were not uh, as generously treated or covered as children in the Basque region or, or, or in Navarra, okay, in the north of, uh, of Spain, okay? So, uh, yeah, and at the same time, we are trying to work with the uh, regional, with the regional level to, you know, basically uh, avoid overlaps between what they do and what we do, so that what we do will be later complemented uh, by the regional uh, communities to address issues that very often 
are uh, shaped by the local environments. It's not working. Sorry. Thank you very much. I now want to, to, to make a, a finally uh, thank to all the, the speakers. And um, I would like to remind you that the um, conference will proceed in the afternoon, in the early afternoon, uh, with two parallel sessions, uh, each, one, uh, each of them uh, devoted to different uh, contexts. So uh, we will have a, a, a session devoted to Italy and uh, the other devoted to, to Spain. To the domestic and regional levels, uh, uh, including in these two member states. And uh, so uh, I hope we meet again uh, at um, one theater. Uh, and um, so thank you to all the speakers and the participants. Uh, so. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. thank you very much. Bye. Thank you. way <clears throat> so um, let's start at uh, 1 uh, uh, 40 almost <laughs> so welcome uh, everybody especially our speakers who are <laughs> the majority in the audience uh, in the in the um, in the room today so my name is Paolo de Stefani I teach international law of human rights in this university and uh, yeah I have the pleasure to to, to introduce the speakers of this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, the idea is to uh, um, uh, approach the multi-level uh, dimensions of uh, children's rights policies in Italy. And I think that uh, with the speakers we have today, we can really have a, a multi-level survey of uh, what is going on uh, uh, in, uh, in our country concerning uh, children's rights, uh, because we have um, Alfredo Ferrante, who is the head of the unit Promotion of Services for the Family, International and Unions Relations at the Department for Family Policies within the, 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 the presidency of our government, of the Council of Ministry. And uh, his presentation is about uh, Italian and European perspectives on children's rights protection. So a very comprehensive view of the policies, both of the national and transnational European dimensions. Then, uh, there will be the presentation by uh, Matteo Tracchi, who is PhD in Human Rights Society and Multilevel Governance at our university. And uh, his presentation is on uh, mainstreaming children's rights uh, in um, educational health and social policies, the Italian case, uh, a case study on our country. So from the you know, European dimension, Italy vis-a-vis uh, the other European, uh, the other states and the European institutions. Uh, now we move towards the national dimension. <clears throat> uh, we continue with uh, Arianna Saulini, um, who is uh, European and Italian advocacy manager of Save the Children Italy, and also coordinator of the CLC group uh, in Italy. So this network, a uh, very big network of uh, NGOs and uh, associations and other entities that monitor the implementation of the CRC in our country. And the title of our presentation is Main Outcomes of the 11th Follow-up Report on the Monitoring of the CRC, the Convention on the Rights of the Child in Italy. Uh, there was a meeting in November 2020, so a few days ago, I suppose. And uh, so we will be updated about uh, the outcome of this uh, important uh, moment in the you know, international monitoring on what is, uh, on what our country is is doing in the in the field of human rights, uh, children's rights protection, and then with uh, <clears throat> Daria, 
who is not yet uh, with us, uh, we will join us uh, probably a little later, who is a professor in sociology at the Department of Political Science, Law and International Studies of our university. Uh, we started the, the, the focus uh, on uh, uh, our region. So the, the, the multi-level dimension only also includes uh, uh, Veneto, the Venice region. Um, her presentation will be a case study on children's rights in Veneto. Do services for children satisfy their needs? And finally, uh, Francesca Reck from the um, office of the Veneto's uh, ombudsperson that has a specific uh, um, task force also for children's rights. Uh, Francesca, advocate Francesca Reck will present uh, the experience of the Veneto's ombudsman in this, uh, in this connection. So um, I would immediately give the floor to Dr. Ferrante because I think he's also has to, to leave us at a certain moment. So it um, makes sense to, to give him immediately the, the, the floor. And uh, we are very um, interested to listen to his presentation, which is, I repeat uh, the title, Italian and European Perspectives on Children's Rights Protection. Yeah, thank you, Chair, and good morning to everyone. Um, just to start with the presentation, I will uh, would like, to, in the meanwhile, to tell you something about the Department of Family Policies, who we are, and, and what we do. And and then, since the the uh, uh, the theme is so wide, as you said, probably we could narrow it down to uh, talk about the the perspective on child. Uh, of children's rights protection in the age of COVID, since we are still, uh, unfortunately, into the uh, into the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic, and, and, and uh, I hope we will get out of it very soon. But probably it's interesting to, to tell you something about what, at the European level, at an Italian level, we are trying to do to uh, combat the, the effects of uh, the pandemic for children and, and um, in our country and, and in Europe. Uh, so, first of all, something about the, uh, the department. Uh, the, the Department for Family Policy is a part of the Prime Minister Office system. Um, and uh, since 2018, uh, with the new law that was adopted in uh, August, the department has a general uh, coordination competence on the protection of the rights of uh, children in, in, in Italy. And uh, just to give you um, a hint of, of the, the system we try to, uh, to coordinate, the, the president, uh, the, the, sorry, the minister for family policies is the president of the National Observatory of the, of the Rights of the Child uh, in Italy. The observatory just to perform uh, whoever is not familiar with that, that body is the um, consultative body for the government and uh, whose members are the representatives from the uh, public uh, system, so the ministries and, and the national institutes uh, uh, interested, in, interested in the, in the children's rights issue, and as well as representatives from social, uh, from civil society organizations. Um, so I'd say it's, it's about 40 something members equally uh, divided into these two uh, sides. And one of the main tasks the, the, the observatory has is to um, elaborate and approve the national action plan on children's rights. So one uh, the important competence that it's, um, it's normally the basis for the uh, national policies on the issue. So uh, going back to the, to the theme of this, this conversation, uh, the, the Italian-European perspective of children's rights in the COVID, uh, the COVID um, age. Uh, what I'd like to say immediately that, of course, the, the, the pandemic is, is having, is going, is going to have uh, a series of um, um, dangerous effects from social point of view, from an economic point of view. But the crisis uh, is going to have most probably deep effects on, on children, uh, on their uh, mental well-being, the social development, 
uh, that safety, privacy, and of course also uh, economic security. Um, and what's more important, most probably, is that the, the, the effects of the pandemic has not, are not distributed uh, equally uh, because there are some uh, children who are the most damaged and among them the uh, children already living in margin marginalization situations uh, in, who are vulnerable, uh, thinking, for example, of children with disabilities. And most probably those damaging effects will have uh, uh, long lasting consequences uh, with child for child poverty. Um, and of course, moreover, the measures for confinement, so-called lockdown, uh, had a very heavy effect on uh, children uh, and mostly children with disabilities, as I was, I was mentioning, uh, because they are the most dependent to um, uh, on face-to-face -face services, health services, education services, and protection uh, services. And just to, to, to mention and to recall another uh, dangerous phenomenon that's about violence, uh, because for uh, what we presume it's going to be a large number of, of children, um, home during the pandemic uh, was the place of, of, of direct violence against them, uh, or probably they witnessed some uh, episodes. Uh, the the, the uh, special number 114 provided by the Telefono Azzurra in Italy uh, provided us with uh, some reports during the pandemic and numbers are uh, really worrying. And um, so it is another phenomenon we need we, we to, 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 to take into account. Um, uh, so just to sum up, we don't know of course, how long the virus will continue to, to circulate. Uh, we, we all know we are talking about vaccines. We hope the solution will come. But of course, the, the, the social and economic and uh, consequences of children uh, will be severe in the long run. So this is a, a, a fact. Um, so what the EU is doing and what the EU could, could do, um, what we think uh, as as uh, as a country, let's say, and also in the negotiations we are having on several tables with the uh, European Commission, is the the European Union need to to take all the steps, the necessary steps to fight um, the um, this particular uh, crisis. Um, I just put down uh, some uh, some points uh, I would like to share with you. Uh, First, reducing educational poverty and inequalities uh, for children, uh, supporting families in the recovery uh, for recovering uh, from the pandemic, uh, preventing domestic uh, violence uh, against children and protecting children from violence, uh, increasing equal access uh, to affordable and quality health services for children, and of course, increasing the participation of children in the decision-making process. Um, on this particular point, uh, we are just in, in these states working on the um, uh, national action plan in Italy with the observatory I was mentioning before. And one of the points we are working on is to ensure that um, children are consulted uh, in, into the process of elaborating the, the, uh, the plan. So we are confident that in, let's say, next spring, when we think the uh, uh, the, the plan will be approved by the observatory. Uh, the view of uh, children uh, will be taken into, into account. Um, but going back to the European Union, um, I, I think we, you are all familiar with the uh, Child Guarantee Initiative uh, promoted by the European Commission. Um, I was checking the data and, and uh, in 2018, 23.4% uh, of children in the EU were at risk of poverty or, or, or social exclusion. So this data is uh, clear enough to, to, to motivate us all to, uh, to push for the uh, Child Guarantee Initiative. Um, I, I would like to recognize also the 
an important role in, of the European Parliament into uh, pushing for the uh, child guarantee initiative. In 2015, the European Parliament called on the European Commission and the member states, I quote, to introduce a child guarantee so that every child in poverty can have access to free healthcare, free education, free childcare, decent housing, adequate nutrition as part of the European integrated plan to combat child poverty. So that was a combined effort by the EU institutions. Um, the good news is for us that Italy was among, among the uh, uh, group of countries uh, chosen to, to uh, run the pilot program for the EU um, Child Guarantee Initiative. Uh, so I can say that in 2021, the, the department, uh, together with the Ministry of Labor and Social Policies, um, and together with UNICEF, we implement uh, this pilot project with the 24-month uh, uh, project um, well, that was labeled as follow, testing the child guarantee in the EU member states. And the program we are trying to elaborate together with UNICEF uh, should and will showcase uh, innovative approaches and innovative uh, uh, national action plans to reduce child poverty and address systematic disadvantages for children uh, in need. Uh, of course, this kind of, of uh, action we are planning and, and I hope in the following weeks we will publish something on our, our websites to give you more detailed information. Uh, these actions will include children at risk of poverty, um, uh, Roma children, children in institutional care, and of course children with disabilities, as well as refugee and migrant uh, children. Uh, the, 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 the aim uh, would be uh, to, to uh, contribute to, to strengthening the capacities of, of Italy in this case to collect, analyze, and present data on, on uh, child poverty and social exclusion to uh, the European arena. Uh, just yesterday, to, to give you this information also, we contributed to the uh, social, um, social pillar public consultation that the European Commission is running. Uh, in order to, to elaborate the future action plan of the social pillar. And of course, we um, underline the need of the, the policy we already, already mentioned, already mentioned um, uh, to you. And okay, that is general framework for the European uh, situation. Uh, what we did as, as, uh, at the national level to uh, support children's rights into the uh, during the pandemic. I put down uh, three points I would like to uh, to recall with you. Um, among many others, uh, I think as a bureaucrat, I can say that those past months were, were uh, a nightmare, uh, on, technically speaking, because of course uh, we, we 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 try to do our best. Uh, to, to do whatever was needed to do to uh, support uh, the, the uh, national action, uh, in this case, to support children to see during the pandemic. But into this uh, institutional uh, and, and, and labor mess, uh, I chose three, three points to recollect, to recollect with you. Uh, the first one uh, is about the guidelines for the safe management of social and leisure opportunities for children during the pandemic. Um, the, uh, the department uh, drafted uh, specific guidelines for the safe management of social and leisure opportunities for children uh, during the emergency, together with the ANCI, that stands for the Association of the Italian Municipalities, uh, together with the regions, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Health, and Ministry of Labor and Social Policies. Uh, the, um, the, the guidelines were published on the, are published on our websites, and uh, the, 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 the aim, let's say, was to uh, protect, uh, contribute to protect the psycho psychological and physical well-being of children during the uh, 
uh, the, the lockdown period and then, of course, during the, the pandemic period. Uh, the second point I would like to, to recall uh, is about the National Observatory of uh, Children's Rights in Italy. Uh, the, 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 the National Observatory was uh, uh, reinstated uh, in April, last April, uh, during the, the full extent of the pandemic, but we thought it was important to give a, a signal of the commitment uh, during this period. And the, the mandate for the observatory is quite extensive and includes, as I told you, the adoption next year of the uh, National Action Plan. Um, but what was important, it, it, uh, under the umbrella of the uh, of the um, observatory uh, and within the framework of the activities carried out by uh, the observatory, um, decided to uh, set up a specific working group uh, of experts for the assessment of the current health emergencies for children and to identify the actions we needed to address the topic of pandemic um, regarding children. Uh, the group has worked during the last months uh, and drafted two documents concerning the uh, remedies to uh, protect children during the, uh, the pandemic. The pandemic addressing the two levels, uh, the, the, the psycho psychological uh, well-being, as well as the learning process and the develop developing uh, process for, for children. Um, the results we published last week, the results on our websites, and the, the group, which was coordinated by uh, Professor Chiara Saraceno, who is a, a well known student, uh, scholar for um, children and, and family policies issues. Uh, was saying the four, the four points, main points, are the following, uh, and I quote one. Uh, first point, investing in schools and infrastructures um, for education, for, for the educational system. Um, in second one, uh, doing whatever we can to guarantee the educational, educational continuity uh, during the emergency and during the pandemic. Um, third point, uh, fighting child poverty, uh, both material and, and educational poverty. And four points, support the rights of children in vulnerable uh, conditions. Um, the, the group recommended also two uh, transversal uh, recommendations. The first one is to reduce territorial inequalities for public goods like healthcare, childcare services, and schools. And, and the second one was to encourage the participation of, of girls, and especially girls in design, boys and girls, but especially uh, girls in designing the actions that concern uh, themselves. Uh, the third point um, is about the call, uh, call for tender that the um, department published in the last uh, June. It was a call for proposal uh, for the financing of leisure, no formal and informal educational projects for the empowerment of children and youth. Um, the, the idea popped up, of course, during the, uh, the lockdown. And so we did our best to draft this uh, call for proposal. Um, the, 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 the aim of the proposal was to uh, uh, allow uh, children during the pandemic period to require knowledge, uh, abilities um, to, to, um, that will contribute to develop their potential as citizens and, of course, promote their commitment uh, towards society and, and, of course, why respecting differences in children. Um, the goal aim to promote educational um, activities to accelerate the recovery uh, after the pandemic. We hoped at the time the pandemic would be over. Of course, that was not uh, the case. And uh, in the, 
it, it was directed to uh, local bodies, local authorities as municipalities and as well as um, the civil society organization. Um, we um, put, on, put on the table 35 million euros and I must say that the results were extraordinary because we received, uh, received like something like uh, 2,000 applications from municipalities and, and uh, civil society organizations. Uh, we uh, closed the evaluation process uh, two weeks ago, and we um, the final result uh, was the financing of uh, something like six, 600 projects. Um, of course, it was not possible to, to finance all the the requests, but uh, just uh, today a new call was published. Uh, it was especially directed to fight um, educational educational poverty. Um, the, the, the 35 million euros will be directed to uh, funding uh, several kinds of projects. Uh, I just wrote down some of the access that were um, funded. Uh, children's empowerment, uh, intercultural exchange, intergenerational, intergenerational uh, dialogue, non-discrimination, equality, inclusion of disadvantaged in the disadvantaged uh, children. Uh, so my time is already over. I, this was just uh, some uh, flashes, let's say, to, to give you an idea of the work we are, we try to do during this. Uh, this period. Uh, the work is not done, of course. The, uh, this call I was mentioning before on, on educational poverty is available on our websites um, uh, now, just now. In the following weeks, we will publish another call, and uh, it, this call will be directed, and it, uh, both calls will be, uh, sorry, the first call is a uh, 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 will amount 15 million euros, the second one 10 million euros, and the second one will be directed to civil society organizations. So we're trying to uh, involve both the uh, public sector and the uh, civil society organization, uh, pushing them whenever it's possible to work together for the aim of protecting, protecting children's rights. Uh, that's it. I hope it was clear enough. I'm so sorry, as I told you before, I need to leave in uh, five minutes. Uh, but thank you so much for the invitation and thank you so much for, for this opportunity to tell you something about our work. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, if you have uh, still five minutes, uh, may, can I maybe ask uh, those who are present, I mean, Matteo, Arianna, if they want to say something, to ask us some questions, I don't know, since we are here and we can take advantage of uh, uh, Dr. Ferrar, uh, Ferrante for a few seconds yet. My comment is that uh, we definitely need to, 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 um, to narrow this gap that has been created by the COVID and also by some other you know, phenomena, social phenomena we have uh, as, uh, as far as uh, children's uh, are concerned, children's rights, and in particular, the, the educational poverty that uh, some segments of the uh, juvenile uh, population in Italy are suffering. And so, well, hopefully, uh, this is an emergency. Uh, an emergency. This is a, a sad event, uh, but uh, at least uh, uh, there is a spotlight now on this uh, very grave, I think, uh, issue. Yeah, if I may, I think this, this is, I absolutely agree. Uh, the crisis, of course, was a powerful uh, a blow to, our, to, to, to us all, but it's also an opportunity. And I think that today, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm very much convinced that the observatory, the National Observatory, is the key uh, leverage for uh, elaborating, pushing for national policies on children's rights. And, and, and today is, is absolutely true because during the pandemic, uh, we, we try to, to, to make this body work. Ariana is also part of the, of the body. And, and 
because you know this kind of 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 body is really the uh, the main table where all the actors uh, sit, and, and all the actors, all the most the most important actors are, are, are there. All the ministries, uh, all the public institutions, the, the municipalities, regions, all the most important uh, civil society organization, and and you know also the the point that the uh, 2018 reform uh, put uh, on, on us the responsibility to coordinate the, the generally speaking, the uh, national policies on children's rights was uh, is also a, a powerful leverage to, uh, let's say, clarify the institutional uh, framework because mm -hmm. uh, what we need as a, as a country, of course, is doing uh, things in, in a simpler way in a more effective way and, and you know also simplify this kind of institutional processes is fundamental to, to get to the, to the results because it, of course what we need to do is working for the uh, children's right and, and, and the child protection and we need to do it all together of course um, I, i'm not saying that running an observatory is an easy task uh, because of course different point of view uh, are present into the table and, and interests are, are somehow different and, and sometimes collide. But that's, I think, is a normal, normal process that we need to, to, uh, uh, to, to govern and, and run because in the, in the long run, at the end of the day, the, 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 final, the final results as the national action plan will be the, uh, the most important thing. And, and I think, of course, we reflect um, very deeply the, uh, the consequences of the pandemic. And, the, and I hope the lessons we need to learn from the pandemic to, to be uh, implemented also when the pandemic will be over. And that said, um, I'm very, very sorry I need to leave because it's uh, 2.10. So again, thank you so much and have a good, have a good time. Thank you very much for your thank contribution. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. So Arianna and Matteo, uh, I think we can uh, continue because uh, these materials will be recorded uh, and used uh, for some other purposes in the framework of the research that Arianna is, uh, sorry, uh, Aida is uh, conducting. So I would uh, now give the floor to Matteo, is you in next, uh, no? in, the, in the list of speakers. And uh, it's a pity that Ferrante is no longer here because uh, I think that both uh, your uh, um, presentation and also Mariana's presentation, uh, Ariana's presentation will be uh, sort of addressed. Uh, now the finding could be uh, usefully addressed uh, to the to the observatory and to Ferrante. But uh, of course, we will uh, deliver to him uh, the recording of this meeting <laughs> for further actions. Okay, so uh, Matteo, um, mainstreaming of children right, children's rights uh, in educational health uh, and social policies, case studies, case studies, case study of Italy. Um, wonderful presentation. Yeah, so hi, good morning, everyone. Hi. Um, it's great because I interviewed both Arianna and Alfredo, so <laughs> they know very well my findings, probably. Um, so yeah, I think I was actually very interested because the child guarantee now is a very important piece of work that Italy is embarking on. So I was very interested in understanding how um, the ministry and the presidency and UNICEF they are all working also with the observatory in order to implement this child guarantee, but um, probably we will have another time to discuss this. So I will give you just a very quick presentation on the main findings. Um, so let me try. So yeah, I, I had the opportunity to be part of this um, research project. Um, the principal investigator is Aida Kish United, and the research project looked at both um, Italy and Spain, and I've been responsible for the, for the Italian case studies. And the idea is to uh, investigate this concept of mainstreaming children's rights, looking at uh, educational health and social policies. 
And so I've been responsible for conducting 16 semi-structured interviews with uh, policymakers, experts, and civil society organizations. And I had the two different angles, the national level one and the regional, um, looking at Veneto region in, in particular. I conducted all interviews uh, in Italian between November and December 2019. And the interview, they lasted about one hour each and I conducted them in person or via telephone and Skype. Then together with the research group, we, we transcribed all these records and we thematically analyzed and translated the main findings in English. So this is just an, a snapshot of the interviews I conducted. As you can see, I differentiated between the national level and the regional one. And so if you, if you can see the institution organization, you can find um, several uh, different ministries uh, of labor and social policies, education, but also uh, the independent authority for children and adolescents, uh, the Innocenti Research Office in Florence, but also NGOs such as SOS Children's Villages, Save the Children, CNCA, and this is my door, sorry, I need to open the door. You are excused. Sorry, I'm back. So I was showing you this table. Um, so at the regional level, I talked to similar people. So concerning the Ministry of Education, I talked to the regional school office in Veneto, then Veneto region, municipality of Venice, but also NGOs and civil society actors concerning, uh, for example, welfare for minors or save the children in particular. Sorry, I ran the stairs. <laughs> so um, for Save the Children, I took to the local manager um, looking at the Veneto region in particular. Okay. So here, this was crucial uh, to capture the multi-level, cross-sectoral and multi-agency perspective at the basis of the research project and to investigate children's rights in educational health and social policies. So uh, what I will try to do now is to give you um, a snapshot of the strengths and weaknesses concerning the implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child and the complexity of children's rights realization and mainstreaming. Okay, so first of all, um, I will give you four strengths and four weaknesses. So the first strength concerns the fact that uh, from my interview analysis, it seems that Italy has a very advanced legislative and policy framework. So Italy has excellent norms and institutions, but there is an overlap often of norms over the years. And there, are, um, there, are, there is also a multitude of actors involved without a clear definition of roles and competencies and a general lack of implementation. So here I put several quotes where uh, we can see that there is very clearly um, expressed this message. So the idea that Italy in a way is at the forefront and it's a, it's a very advanced system concerning the children's rights legislative and policy framework but at the same time, it seems that at national level, it is very hard to transform this uh, framework into practice. So the transition from norm to practice is very complicated. So Italy has a very strong um, uh, framework on the paper, but it is often not very well coordinated. And this is similar uh, both at the national level and at the regional level, because the last quote 
comes from a regional interview that I conducted. And also there, um, there is written that the last part is missing. So the last part is the one of the implementation um, decrees. Then the second strength, uh, obviously you are familiar with the Italian system and we all know now with the pandemic is even uh, clearer the fact that there are regional competencies concerning health and social policies. So um, since the reform of the title fifth of the constitution happened in 2001, we know that uh, um, regions have a strong say concerning health and social policies while uh, education remains more centrally managed by the Ministry of Education. So uh, from my interview analysis, it seems that the fact of moving competencies and resources to regions um, is in a way positive because there is this recognition of moving towards citizens' needs. So moving competencies and resources is considered a positive uh, move, but at the same time, there is the, a general consensus from my interviews that uh, this reform is still nowadays incomplete because uh, the state has never exhaustively defined the so-called performance essential levels or livelli essenziali delle prestazioni in Italian. So uh, I know that there has been a lot of work, work going on concerning the performance essential levels, even uh, right now. But uh, at the same time, we are not uh, there yet. And, and this is obviously very problematic because the, uh, this um, impacts on the fact that Italy has a very fragmented system and there are huge regional differences and territorial inequalities, exactly because we don't have um, a, a comprehensive system of performance essential levels. So in a way, the ratio is clear on giving competencies and resources to regions, but still in order to have this framework um, properly working, there is this need for performance essential levels. Then another uh, strength, uh, and this is very much aligned with what uh, Dr. Ferrante was, was mentioning, is for sure that over the last couple of years, there has been um, increasing public attention from national to local level and the allocation of more funds uh, concerning specific issues connected to children's rights. And over the last couple of years, uh, these are the issues that have been most um, predominantly funded or allocated with projects. So children with disabilities, children in alternative care when they turn 18, and the broad topic of educational poverty. And uh, several of my interviews also mention specific national projects and programs that are considered excellent practices in Italy. So these are, for example, the CareLiver Network that was mentioned this morning, which is led by the Association Agio Volando and its national projects supported by the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy, but also the PP program, the program of intervention for the prevention of institutionalization, the Get Up National Project and the National Program for the Inclusion of Roma, Sinti and Caminanti Children. These are all national program and projects that have been repeatedly mentioned during my interviews in Italy at both national and regional level. Several projects, uh, good practices emerged also from the Veneto region, uh, such as for example, student uh, and youth councils at regional and local level, as well as very good projects in um, in schools or concerning children with disabilities and foreign minors. But here we go uh, once again back to one of the main weaknesses of the Italian system. And so the fact that these projects, even if they're very good and excellent, they are limited to certain regions, municipalities and territories or specific schools. So uh, this again um, goes back to the very fragmented system and patchy implementation of Italy. Then uh, one last strength concerns the, the role of the European Union. So several of my interviews um, highlighted both the European Union, but also the Council of Europe, and in particular the CAHEM, which is the ad hoc committee for the rights of the child. And, uh, and furthermore, uh, three interviewees mentioned the child guarantee as an interesting piece of work. And now we know because I conducted these interviews in November, December last year, so we know that this piece of work kept going on and now Italy has been 
in, is being selected to, to implement the child uh, guarantee. In general, we, we can say that both at national and regional level, as well as for, from policymakers to third sector organization, the role of the EU is considered crucial, in particular for two reasons, setting a common framework and for providing funds. So the, these are the two main roles of the European Union. However, um, when I conducted the, the regional level interviews, it seems that uh, the more we, um, we go far away from, from the territory, the, the more difficult it becomes to understand how the European Union and its directives and recommendations can be um, implemented. So uh, from regional interviews, it emerged very clearly the complexity of ensuring an effective multi-level governance from the EU to the territory and vice versa. And this is why, as a general remark in my interview analysis, I says that it seems that the more the distance between the decision level and the need on the territory increases, the less it is likely to have an impact on the ground. This means that while uh, at the national level with national interviews, it, it, it seems easier to understand the connection with the European level, then when we go to the regional level, it becomes more difficult to understand uh, the European level and make use of the European level in uh, the daily work of regional actors and, and institutions. Then we move to the uh, weakness. So the first one is obviously uh, very strong, this idea of a limited short-term political vision. So the fact that often um, politics is, is driven by short-term objectives. And obviously children's rights, here I put several quotes from various stakeholders. So children's rights need uh, medium and long-term policies and approaches. And obviously they also uh, need a substantial multi-year funds. So what does it mean? That basically we cannot question and put into question children's rights at every change of government, but we need programs that are all, uh, all embracing and in a way automatically renewed. So we should, not be, um, we, we should not question whether to invest on children's rights or not or we should not uh, misuse uh, children's rights to show quick results in order to be reelected. This comes from, uh, from one of, of the quote. So this is probably uh, one of the factors that uh, um, impedes the realization of children's rights. At the same time, another interesting finding is this idea of lack and or inadequacy of human resources, working conditions, and professional training for people employed in social health and educational sectors and services dealing with children's rights. So uh, this uh, was very clear, the fact that often um, professionals working for children's rights in health and educational and, um, and social sectors are underpaid, they have very precarious contracts, and, and so this is definitely an issue. And at the same time, several of my interviews highlighted that it, it would be good to strengthen the academic preparation of these professionals. So educators, social, social workers, psychologists, so that they can be more prepared to implement children's rights in their, their work. This finding was even stronger at the regional level because um, it, it came out very clearly from the, from the regional interviews that the quality, quantity, and status of human resources have a direct impact on the capacity of professionals and services to respond to citizens' needs and vulnerabilities on the ground. And here I put two quotes from the municipality of Venice and from a welfare for minors, which is this umbrella organization in Veneto that puts together various actors um, dealing with uh, um, children's rights. And it is very clear here that often it's a, it's obviously about economic resources, but often uh, about human resources as well. And when we say human resources, not only quantity of human resources, which is obviously an issue, but also the quality of, of these people. And this is also why uh, it would be good to strengthen the academic preparation and also considering in-service training for these people. So in the second quote, we see that, for example, this training for um, various professionals working with children's rights, um, this in-service training often happens in a very fragmented way. 
So for example, social workers are trained only with social workers, educators only with educators and so on. And what it ended up that uh, the different professionals speak different languages, even if they are all working for the same reason, so implement children's rights. So maybe we should consider a more holistic approach also in the training of these professionals. Uh, then obviously the strongest finding, we know um, very clearly this finding is, is very um, well known in the literature as well, uh, is that the Italian context is characterized by a very fragmented system in the field of social health and educational policies. And this leads to very diverse practices and huge territorial differences and inequalities. Uh, from the interview analysis, um, it seems that this is connected to the lack of a control room at the national level and the lack of coordination among various levels, so national, regional, and municipal, but also within the same level of governance. So, for example, looking at the regional level between different sectors, such as social health and education. Um, we know that um, as, re as required by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, Italy as a national authority for children and adolescent. It has just recently been appointed. Carla Garlatti will be the new national authority. So uh, best of luck for her work. Um, from an interview analysis that I conducted, as I said, in November, De December 2019, it seems that this national authority does not have any coordination role. And probably it would need more independence and autonomy, as well as more human, technical, and financial resources in order to properly work as this um, body should, according to the UN Convention. And um, Italy has also several um, regional authorities for children and adolescents. Uh, Veneto has one. We, we have a speaker actually that will be talking, uh, part of the Ombuds person in, uh, in Veneto. But from my interview analysis, it was very clear that these regional authorities have very different roles and competencies, and they work very differently from region to region. So once again, it is very hard to give an overall picture for looking at Italy, but um, these authorities uh, work very differently. It really depends on the region we are considering. So this, is, this again is obviously um, a weakness. And finally, the last, um, the last uh, weakness that I would like to mention is that um, more than a weakness, I would say that it was very clear from the interview analysis that there is this sort of cultural legacy uh, that might even today negatively impact on children's rights. Uh, and so, for example, while I was talking during my interviews about uh, the role of the family or children's right to participate, um, there was this mentioning to the fact that in Italy, it is very much present the idea to look at children only through the lens of family. And this necessarily poses challenges, including the assumption that achieving family policies is enough for children as well. And so um, obviously we know because we, 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 um, we've heard from Dr. Ferrante that, that now children's, children's rights are under the umbrella of um, the family unit. So obviously uh, all my interviewees um, agree that uh, family is surely the best environment where a child can grow up. But at the same time, this is not always the case. And therefore, the, uh, there was consensus that, that we should keep a focus on, uh, on the child, his or her needs and rights. So obviously, children's rights and family policies, as you can see from the quote that they put, are closely interconnected. Uh, there is no one without the other. But at the same time, again, um, we, we should always do not assume that achieving family policies is enough for children as well. So this is very uh, important. And I was looking for a sentence or a picture to, to close the presentation, and I decided for this one. So uh, the idea that in Italy there have been several advancements concerning the implementation of children's rights. Uh, but we, we may not be there yet in terms of the full realization of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and probably it, it's also even impossible to fully implement such a high level international standard at the national and local level. Uh, but we are closer than yesterday. So Italy has had several advancements and we know how to do things, at least on a theoretical level. We have very good examples, best practices, excellent projects, 
The question is how to take stock of all the good stuff that have been going on in Italy, um, learning these lessons and further implement and improve, always looking at, at children's rights and putting the children's needs at the center of, of our decision making at all the level uh, from, from national to regional. So thank you and sorry for, for the run. Thank you, Matteo. Well, excellent. I, I'm not sure, however, if I agree with your last uh, uh, sentence because, uh, <laughs> you know, um, after many years uh, that uh, I hear about uh, diagnosis done uh, on the Italian case, you know, children's rights, uh, the CRC, etc. Um, I'm I mean, I'm always struck by the fact that uh, the, 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 the issues, you know, the problems are more or less uh, always the same, you know, this uh, uh, fragmented uh, landscape uh, of uh, social policies, uh, uh, the, the lack of coordination between the different levels, uh, uh, cultural uh, biases, let's say, that includes uh, systematically any issues concerning child, child's rights. In the, within the family context uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, maybe we are closer, but uh, I have the impression that uh, <laughs> they are not much closer than, uh, let's say, some, some years ago. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, yeah, in, in, some, in some specific uh, instances, in some specific fields, uh, we, of course, have made uh, some uh, uh, steps forward, but uh, the general landscape has not changed so much. I mean, for the better, I, I mean, um, and, uh, but I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you can, uh, uh, if you have, uh, uh, you know, analyze the system, the situation from a little of a historical perspective, uh, because I, I noticed that your, your focus was definitely, you know, in 2019, uh, in this context uh, and so on. Um, but uh, I don't know, did you have the, 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 some insights so that uh, uh, we are moving towards a certain direction or we are sort of uh, mm, surfacing? <laughs> no, I think we, we, we are definitely moving, which is uh, good. And at the same time, um, I think it's always um, important to have this positive uh, and proactive perspective that rather than always complaining. So obviously uh, there is room for improvement, as I said, there are many areas in which Italy can improve, but at the same time, it's also important if we look at the international perspective. So the various um, comment, comments from the committee and so on, or at the European level, Italy in a way is, is considering all the recommendations and is trying to implement, even the fact that there are so many actors so many institutions dealing with children's rights. I think it's a positive aspect. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and so also the fact that there are more funds, definitely. Uh, I mean, I was a bit surprised when I quickly realized well, when I was conducting my interviews that economic resources um, that do not seem an issue anymore. Mm -hmm. because, so this was, I believe that a five or seven and ten years ago, economic resources uh, were definitely an issue concerning children's rights. I mean, NGOs were struggling to find resources to implement projects. Right now, this does, doesn't seem an issue anymore. So um, I, I think that there, there has been certain improvement. Even if, even if you look, and so that I can give the floor to, to Ariana, if you, if you look at the monitoring report of the um, CRC, um, in Italy, it is clear that there has been such an improvement, but obviously we should always look for, for further implementation. But at the same time, as I said, I'm not sure that such an ideal standard as the UN CRC is, can be uh, definitely implemented fully, 100% implemented at national level and even uh, harder at the regional level, but because also for me, it was super interesting to to have these two perspectives, national and regional. And, and Daria, my colleague, will, will tell us a little bit more on this because also there, the perspective is very, very different. Okay, thank you. So uh, we, 
Um, it's an ideal conclusion to pass the ball to Arianna because her presentation is exactly about uh, the, the conversation that exists between Italy and the, the national monitoring bodies, uh, um, the CRC committee in particular. So uh, main outcomes uh, of the 11th follow-up report on the monitoring of uh, CRC in Italy, November 2020. Hi, Paola. Hi to everyone. Uh, let's see if I can share the, my monitor. It works. Very well. Very well. OK, great. Go ahead. Uh, so very interesting to listen to uh, Ferrante and the, the outcome of their research. Um, we try to have the historical because uh, this year we published the 11 follow-up report on monitoring the CRC in Italy. And so we try to also get an idea of what have been done in the past uh, 20 years, which were the, uh, the goal that we achieved in somewhere and which are the challenge we are facing too. And uh, it was interesting because we asked that to all the person who were involved in writing the report. And we realized that there was a lot of things done in the past years, of course, especially from the legislative point of view. And there is still some, some gap we need to, to cover. Um, so this is the, um, the cover of our report. And uh, the report was published uh, last uh, week on the uh, 20th of November. As you may know, 20th of November is International Day of Children's Rights, and it's also the National Day of Children's Rights, since a law in Italy um, declared it in 97. So we keep, as usually, the moment of celebrating children's rights to give an analysis uh, and to address politicians with specific recommendations. The network that was established 20 years ago, so we celebrate this year the 20th anniversary, is made of 100 associations just right now. And uh, the other characteristic of the network is that um, they're all NGO working in different, different fields. This allows us to have a comprehensive vision of children's rights from different uh, perspectives and in different uh, areas. And it is reflected in the report since uh, 135 persons worked uh, to write the report. This means, of course, that if you read it from the beginning at the end, you see that the language is a little bit changed because we got pediatrician, we got uh, uh, educators, we got uh, lawyers. So the language is a little bit different. Sometimes it's more technical. Sometimes it's more um, available for public in general. But the main idea is that we follow in the same kind of communication. So we are never aggressive, but we always try to analyze the situation and find out which is the recommendation suggestion we can um, address to institution. Uh, another characteristic of the report is that, of course, we refer to the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child recommendation to Italy. The last one were uh, published last year in February 2019. So this is a, a sort of um, guide that we use since uh, we know that Italy, uh, the, go the government, Italian government should uh, refer to them in the next report to the committee. And we, from last year, we include also in our analysis the connection with the SDGs. This is quite important for us since uh, there is a lot of attention, especially political attention on SDGs and achieve these goals. And of course, um, SDGs and children's rights need to go together. And they can, they are a part of the same uh, um, path, let's say. So, of course, it's very important to link one to the others. Um, so, to launch the report last week, we, you asked me which are the main outcome of the report. So, my suggestion, I will give you the link, is to, to have a look at the report because there are a lot of arguments inside. But we decided to focus even for the launch of the report on five topics. Um, and the idea basically is that uh, we are in a special moment just right now. So this moment is particularly, in, it's also strategic for children's rights. So uh, it's important to see which are the challenge, let's say in a positive way that uh, COVID will, uh, will give for children's rights. 
And um, the other aspect is that um, since we follow the CRC and uh, everyone know that the CRC is very important from, for the holistic approach that promoting children rights, uh, this means that all children are interlinked one to the other. And um, moreover, that if you see the well-being of the child, it's important to see in a very comprehensive way. So we choose uh, topics that are not, uh, mm, that are quite, uh, um, they, can, they can be seen from different point of view, different administrative point of view. Uh, also because one of the critical thing is the governance on children's rights. And it's, it's true that uh, at the moment the Observatory on Children's Rights is doing a great job, uh, but it's really a challenge because each, uh, each ministry finally uh, approach the problem just from their point of view. So uh, they don't share um, action and uh, information each other. So from the child perspective, sometimes it's very difficult to to, to me and to, to achieve what um, the, the, the real well-being, let's say that. So the first issue, the first topic is related to the social networking and internet. And of course, it's very actual things because um, during the lockdown, uh, even the adults use a lot, a lot more the, the internet and the social. Um, and uh, we underline, we want to underline the, the positive aspect uh, of the social network uh, and the negative and the risk. There are, in particular, we underline that there are um, two different uh, age uh, of attention. It was very interesting that for, for the first time was published in Italy um, an analysis of the use of media device by young people, children, that means under two years of old. And everybody know about, because there are scientific um, uh, results of study on that, that is not uh, convenient for a child so small to use and uh, to be exposed to, to, to a media device. Uh, but the result of the, the analysis was very interesting because uh, 34, more than 34% of children that uh, less than six months are spending time in front of the computer or TV or smartphone. And if we know, if we get to know how many time they spend, we realize that one, to, uh, we classify, they classify one, two hours in front of the screens. We got a percentage that uh, is 8.7% uh, up to six months and arrive at 31% uh, at one year old. So that means that 31%, one, almost one in four children of one year old spend one, two hours a day in front of the screen. So this is something we have to take care of, let's say. When we talk about adolescent, of course, the situation is different. We know that 87% and more of children and adolescents between 11 and 70 years old use the mobile phones. Uh, of course, in this case, the risks are connected to the fact that they can have an addiction, they use too much it, and the cyber bullies. So we analysis uh, specifically these two risks in, in the report. And uh, connected to the lockdown, it was highlighted that social media will represent for, especially for teenagers, uh, a sort of a lifeline. I mean, they, they use it to get in contact with uh, other uh, with friends, uh, to receive lessons from school. So it was very important. And we can see it as a very, very um, important instrument. They also receive information through, through the social uh, media. Uh, but um, what the lockdown highlight is also a digital divide, a very strong digital divide between different children. And uh, the result of a research conducted by ISTAT show that uh, two of, out of three adolescents uh, between 14 and 70 have not uh, a low or basic digital skill. So this is very also important result of an analysis because um, it means that even they use internet every day, if, even if they are a smartphone, they don't have digital skill. So the recommendation in this sense is really to promote a digital culture also from adults, but also for adolescents 
in a way that it can um, take the opportunity and advantage of internet and to use it in a proper way. So it's really become the time also because there are a lot of resource on that and there will be a resource in the next uh, year uh, to use that to promote digital character among uh, adolescent. Uh, another topics that we would like to underline and uh, that we underline actually is the, the situation inside the family. What the lockdown alight again is that not all the family were in the same situation. So of course we underline the, um, the family that found themselves in a sort of fragility that could be due to economic problem, uh, violence, or there are also children who are outside of the family of, family of origin or there are children who, who, whose parent is in uh, prison. So there are a lot of different fragility inside the family, but even for the family that let's say work well, uh, the lockdown um, underlined the necessity to support them, especially in the first year uh, when they've got small children or also when they are adolescent. There are very two critical phase of the of, of, um, children. Uh, and it's important uh, that uh, if they find uh, quality, uh, quality services and uh, accessible services, and there is a coordination, uh, this is a, a very strong impact on, the on the developing the resilience of the family of the children themselves. On the contrary, um, our research um, highlights that Italy is just 19 compared to other European countries for national policy in support of family. So we, are not have, we have not yet developed a very good um, support for family. And again, here it's very evident that each uh, single ministry work on a specific part and you uh, get the attention just if you find in a difficult, very difficult situation why the important thing is to reach quite almost all, all the family. So, and it's also important to guarantee a multidimensional and integrated support for the families. In this regard, again, there will be a lot of attention about that because the, the pandemic crisis uh, put it very, very in evidence. So now it's, we know and politicians know and the ministry know that there is this necessity. So the, um, we hope that, for example, in the next uh, plan of action, there will be specific action for that and found. Another important issue is the one of the environment. Um, this is very linked, of course, with the SDGs goals. Um, but it's also something that we have a little bit ignored in the last years. Uh, it was very important on that. I think the, mov the movement of children that uh, for, with Friday for Future just, you know, demonstrate to all the others that um, the environment is something that is important, very important also for children, specifically and uh, most of all for children. And even in Italy, we have problems uh, connected to, um, to pollution, especially for traffic. Uh, with the consequence that a lot of children uh, grow up in a um, hair in an ambience indoor or, and outdoor with a lot of pollution. There is also a risk connected to the fact that, especially in the city, there is no, uh, there is less, there are less opportunity for uh, to move and make, uh, you know, to, to green spaces or uh, you know, cycle. Uh, roof or something like that. So this is also a consequence for the health of children. Uh, the positive way in this sense is that during the lockdown for a very limited period of time, there was a reduction uh, of the pollution, but this is something that will go away quite soon. So we have to rethink about a more um, eco-sustainable development model and in line what was the agenda approved and uh, that we have to respond by 2030. And um, finally, the, the, the other topics is the one linked to the equal rights, what we say, but there are different implementation in the country. There are three main areas where we can see that. 
One is regarding poverty, and we have already, um, the person who talked before me, uh, have already underlined the number of children living in absolute poverty in Italy that is really high um, and is impressive. But it's also impressive to note that uh, all the families that uh, have children and uh, that are in poverty, they are um, a risk of poverty, higher risk of poverty because they have children. And the risk is higher if they have more than one children. And the risk is higher and the intensity of poverty is higher if they are under, if they have children. And if they live in the south of Italy, on in the island, uh, compared to the north, for example, and the risk is higher again if they are uh, not Italian citizenship. So this means, for example, that if you have three kids that live in the in a one region in the south, you have in a risk of probability possibility to be in absolute poverty, and this is something that what the government should refer when they. Um, work on measure, a national measure to contrast and to uh, prevent poverty. Because the number of children in poverty, if we look the number in the past 10 years, uh, is the group age group who, who was, uh, who, which percentage is going higher compared to the other age group. So this means that, the, um, that we have to review the measure that were adopted because they don't address uh, efficiently the families with children. Another issue concerning inequalities is the one of education. Uh, and there are different um, uh, items we can refer to. Uh, first of all, if we look of the possibility of a nursery on services under for kid, children under three years old, uh, the percentage of uh, place available is very different along the country. And we have quite almost the region of the South with very high, very low percentage. Uh, just to give an idea, we know that the, um, the EU ob uh, objectives is the one to cover 33% of children in this, uh, in this age, during this, in this age. And um, these objectives were uh, reached just by a couple of regions in like Emilia Romagna and Tuscany who are quite uh, offer a uh, very good offer on this kind of services, but some region of the South have just three, four percent. So this means that 96 percent of children under three are excluded from uh, nursery services. Uh, we can also consider early school leavers. That is something that also worried quite a lot, um, NGO working on that field, because we are very far away from which is the media um, reached by the EU countries. Uh, and there is, a, again, a very significant difference between north and south of the country. Uh, the other aspect we can consider is the quality of learning. And this is um, estimated through PISA OXE data. Uh, again, here the percentage in South and the Highland uh, are very in is very worse compared to the one of the South, uh, the North. Um, the students here don't reach uh, su this sufficiency are quite uh, fifty percent, so it's very very high. Uh, another important item was uh, that when with the lockdown that we have in during the spring, uh, all the schools were um, closed, and uh, so the system, the education system, transfer via web. And uh, it inserts now, now we know the data, but even at that time, uh, it was um, for NGO working on the field. It was quite uh, immediately that there was something that was not going on well. So one student on 10 did not attend uh, the class during that peri period of time, and 20% of them just occasionally. This means that they generated what we call a learning loss, and it will be very diff difficult to recover from it, especially if we don't work on that just right now. Um, sorry, Ariana, uh, that's because we are talking about the school. Uh, there is an emergency now because Daria has to, to leave us at uh, 3.30 
and I have to give her the floor as soon as possible. So I've uh, got just the, the last slide. Yeah, thank you very much, Ariana. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the other question is the health. Uh, the health is uh, the, um, there are different data that um, make us understand that there is a lot of inequality also in access to health services. Just to give you an idea, there is a difference in prenatal mortality between North region and South region. So finally, what we can say is that uh, the COVID could be a moment, a momentum where we rethink about the policy and the agenda for children rights. And uh, we try to get the advantage of the fund coming from the EU, especially the next generation fund, uh, to implement organic measure for children and to put really on practice the CRC. And the idea is that we have to leave something concrete to the new generation and not just uh, uh, what we call the, 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 the debito <laughs> that was uh, I gave for them. So if you would like to, you find the, all the report in, uh, in our web website. And here is the, um, the link for the, the English section. You don't find here the, the report because it's just in Italian, but you will find also other important information. Thank you to everybody. Thank you, Arianna, and sorry for uh, having interrupted you. Uh, now the floor is to Daria Panebianco, the case study on children's rights in Veneto, the region of Venice. Do services for children satisfy their needs? Yeah, the floor. Good Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Sorry about the interruption for Arianna. <laughs> I'm going to share the screen now. Uh, can you see the screen now? Very well. Okay. Um, um, so then the study I'm going to present you uh, this afternoon is a, a case study uh, on five vulnerable families um, in order to explore if uh, um, families do experience in the region Veneto the satisfaction of children rights as promoted by the CRC. Um, in the last uh, uh, 10 years, uh, uh, in the region of Veneto, um, uh, the region of Veneto has been involved in uh, um, several projects in order to strengthen the culture of childhood and adolescence through the international cooperation and also innovation with the involvement and active participation of different subjects through the sex sector organizations, schools and institutions. Um, at the regional level government, with the partnership of different subjects like University of Padova, uh, Association of Human Rights, uh, Associazione Diritti Umani Sviluppo Umano, um, the Coordinamento Nazionale Comunità di Accoglienza, the NGO uh, Amnesty uh, International, uh, various activities uh, have been undertaken like conferences, seminars, even training days, um, in order to encourage a kind of reflection on the central of children, uh, their need uh, um, and their specific interest. Um, for instance, uh, um, in Venice, uh, the service uh, Politiche Cittadine per l'Infanzia e l'Adolescenza, presso l'Assessorato um, le Politiche Sociali, um, uh, runs several um, interventions for the effective exercise of children's rights um, through um, different actions, for example, uh, the help of the uh, Servizio Educativo Domiciliare, uh, which is a now rich educational service, uh, the work uh, with Voluntary legal professionals, uh, the Centro per l'Affido, which is a service for children in alternative care, and financial resources intervention with an accompanied minors. Um, despite of these, uh, um, welcoming practices uh, and inclusion still remains a, a, an issue, a challenge for the uh, Italian services and the school system uh, that has to um, the need to review uh, methodology and strategies uh, to satisfy children's needs. Um, so we can have a look at some issues in the satisfaction of children's rights uh, in Italy and more specifically in the region of Veneto. 
um, in general, in Italy, uh, we can uh, see the uh, students with disabilities are often isolated from their class group in order to carry out activities in separate classes, and this reproduces special classes. Um, there is also a lack of specialized care in the field of mental health, and this increases the phenomenon of multiple discrimination. Uh, also, subjects with severe disability are not properly included in the economic, social and cultural spheres. Uh, demonstrating this, there is still a stagnation of the process of inclusion in our society. Um, also, there are difficulties in a social and occupational integration for immigrant families with children, uh, particularly um, those that can um, count on strong social support networks. Um, also, there are linguistic and interpretative difficulties that uh, make harder the care of immigrant minors and therefore the guarantee of their right. Um, if we have a look at the regional level, Veneto, we can see that there is still a lack of families for children in alternative care. Um, also, uh, poor support for families with children in difficulty. Um, there are low levels uh, of social inclusion of disabled and foreign children, um, particularly the participation to local life and the access to spaces for the spare time. Um, uh, service for unaccompanied minors in Padua is an effective protective response for children uh, produce a cultural change in our society, but this experience still remains smaller uh, so as to be reinforced. Um, so, um, ensuring uh, minor rights is an uh, issue that has been uh, investigated uh, at the national scenario, at the regional level, so in Veneto too, but um, we need more recent qualitative data um, that, um, to try to analyze the key factors uh, which determine effectiveness policy implementation and to document the actual practices of institutions and also service providers uh, involved in children protection. Um, so, uh, this study applying a qualitative approach uh, had the purpose to explore the existing facilitating factors and obstacles to satisfying children's rights in Veneto, but as perceived by vulnerable families. Uh, particularly um, families that I interviewed, uh, they were family uh, with children at uh, risk of poverty, children with disabilities, children in alternative care, uh, migrant children and accompanied minors. Um, so I conducted five interviews, uh, more specifically, I interviewed uh, uh, the mother of two children, 17 and three years old in foster care living in Padova. Uh, the mother of an 11 years old disabled child was a severe form of uh, autism. Um, so in Padova, uh, the grandmother of a 10 years old child, the risk of poverty, living in Vicenza, uh, the mother of 15 years old, an accompanied minor in her care, living in Vicenza, and the last was the mother of three immigrant children, 27, 17, and 11 years old, living in Verona. Um, so I conducted five in-depth interviews uh, between January and February 2020. Uh, interviews were conducted in Italian language. Uh, the, dura the duration was one hour. Uh, they were audio recorded, um, then transcribed, uh, analyzed, developing a, a thematic analysis of the interview record. Uh, and then, of course, uh, translated in English. Um, interview were conducted in presence where possible, otherwise on the phone and in video conference. And uh, I'm trying to understand uh, uh, their uh, need and concern uh, in education, health and social care. Um, the investigated areas uh, were um, some information about social demographics, uh, levels of cultural and social satisfaction, for instance, the participation in leisure activities, uh, sport, uh, the inclusion of school, uh, like the abolition of special classes, uh, the lack of gender and specialized practices of healthcare, uh, assistance and protection in case of need, also for foreigners, uh, for example, uh, services encouraging the school participation, uh, income uh, supporting benefit, uh, welcoming and supporting practices in case of 
of need and access to support networks. Um, so result uh, shed line on some facilitating factors and obstacles in satisfying the children need. Um, let's start with the facilitating factors. Um, so what the, uh, the, the result that shed light on the support in the education field and access to the labor market through school training. Um, so, for example, uh, um, there was the grandmother interviewed that uh, she said that um, she gets some help from Tutela uh, Minori uh, office because they go to school and pick the child up and also they, they take uh, the child um, to the house and help him uh, in doing his homework. Um, Another example is there are schools uh, that engage students in uh, different laboratories uh, like English and music. Um, and also, um, another mother interview, she said that the son gets some training, for example, in, in this case, in the countering field. Um, at, this, at the hand, they can um, get a kind of qualification, which is recognized at the European level. Uh, and also, he can choose to uh, continue school, so attend the high school. Uh, another facilitating factor uh, um, is about civil society and non-government organization uh, that provide social support, so facilitating the satisfaction of children's rights. Uh, particularly, uh, I'm talking about symbolic support, uh, material help, uh, help in terms of, con of contact and learning. Um, so, for example, one of the person interviewed, she said that uh, Caritas uh, helps with shopping for the child. Um, another mother interview, she said that there are uh, quite few third sector organizations helping, even for material staff, for example, uh, high chair or stroller, uh, but also uh, they can rely on uh, um, psychological support, uh, specifically during the first period of the time of the foster care. Uh, another example um, is uh, um, what Centro Studi Immigrazione and the help that uh, people can get from uh, this service uh, engaging immigrant uh, children in extrascholastic activities. So um, it helps also with the social inclusion because they can uh, learn, for example, the Italian language. But also uh, there are some obstacles uh, particularly um, that refers to uh, the lack or inadequacy of human and economic resources, uh, valuable professional training skills uh, and support to parents in responding children need. Um, for example, uh, to give you some example, uh, one of the mother I interviewed, uh, she said that uh, um, the teacher of uh, her child, they didn't understand uh, properly uh, the, the child need. Uh, so, because they should have some specific ski skills, uh, because uh, children for self care, they may have specific different needs than other children. And also she complained about um, the social worker helped uh, them because she said they didn't have enough experience or empathy. Um, also, uh, one of the mother interviews, she said that um, sometimes they struggle because uh, uh, family come to Italy, they don't receive uh, uh, information, for example, about schools and health system. Um, and also, uh, another woman interview, um, she said that they struggle because they, they, they will need some training in order to manage to deal with the uh, children with disability. So she said, I wish we could get more psychological support from the social services. And also, um, there is a lack of coordination and diversity in political orientation, public administration lead to uh, uh, territorial differences as a card action to meet the children need. Um, for example, the mother of the immigrant children I interviewed, uh, she said that uh, the daughter was bullied because foreigner. Uh, in the beginning, uh, um, there were problems in the school uh, the daughter attended because nobody had them, but then they decided to change school. Uh, they were able to receive uh, a strong symbolic support from the principal and teacher as well. 
Um, also another problem, uh, an example is that uh, there are uh, municipalities that are uh, entitled to um, project that uh, can uh, provide some support uh, for their integration, so helping satisfaction uh, of children's rights. Uh, but then uh, uh, there are other villages uh, uh, close by where the situation is very different and they don't get any help uh, just because maybe there is a, a different administration. Um, finally, children's rights are still subsumed under family policies when they should be guaranteed beyond the family's resources. Um, so for example, uh, there was a mother saying that they don't get enough benefit uh, to meet uh, the children need, so they have to take care of their need. Um, also, there was another mother saying that uh, thinking that the state should give uh, more money for the children future, so they have to think about this. Um, and also, um, there was another mother um, saying that uh, sometimes there are extra-scholastic activities, but children can't attend these activities uh, because uh, um, still there's the thing that we need to rely on families, uh, for example, to take children to school and attend the course. So at the end, there is nobody attending the, the classes because nobody within the family can take them to the school. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, the purpose of the study was to identify facilitating factors and obstacles to satisfying children's needs as perceived by vulnerable families in Veneto. Uh, we can see two main facilitating factors. Uh, institutions support achievement in the education feed the labor market and community and this sector organization provide social support promoting children's needs. But on the other end, there is a lack of and or inadequacy of human and economic resources within service and institutions, professional training from special need, skilled professional and support to family members in order to understand and to satisfy children's need. Um, there are uh, important uh, territorial differences in meeting children's need and uh, children's rights are still subsumed under policy, uh, family policies. Um, so it is. It seems that uh, we need. Uh, uh, we still need uh, some intervention, important intervention, aimed at um, preventing uh, discrimination and stagnation of the processes of inclusion uh, of disabled children, uh, promoting the social integration of immigrant children. Um, providing parents with a higher level of social support, uh, particularly um, in the case of disability and alternative care, and building social support networks, helping parents to deal with difficulties they, they meet in satisfied children need. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think there is a good... Uh, uh, sort of uh, matching between uh, the um, what uh, what uh, emerged from the research of uh, Matteo, who interviewed uh, experts, uh, operators, and so on, and what you discovered by talking with uh, with the, the 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 beneficiaries of such uh, you know social and other policies. So. Um, now, uh, I give the floor to Francesca Reck, Advocate Francesca Reck, who works for the Veneto Guarantor of Rights, okay, so the, the Ombudsman of the Venice, of the Venice region. And uh, well, the title of her presentation is The Experience of the Veneto's Ombudsperson. Um, and uh, yeah, we are listening to you, you are the floor. Um, if you can manage to finish by, well, let's say uh, 1530. Okay, uh, I will try. Okay, so maybe we have a time to have a small discussion yeah. among those. And in any case, interest. in case you just stop me and I, never but I try to, to do my best to be in time. Uh, thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Uh, ciao Paolo. We have been working together also in the project of uh, Publico tu uh, Tutore dei Minori. So Paolo De Stefani knows perfectly well uh, actually what I'm going to say. 
The um, Dr. Pane Bianco mentioned, in fact, uh, l'ufficio del pubblico tutore dei minori, which now has changed the name into Garante dei diritti della persona del Veneto. In any case, the story is that this uh, sort of office was founded in 1988, which made us very proud uh, as it was the year before the uh, New York Convention on Rights, uh, on Children's Rights. So somehow it, sort of, it was a sort of a dream coming up in terms of uh, uh, trying to create a new system in dealing with uh, protecting minors and developing uh, the uh, ideas and thoughts uh, and also efforts to solve problems about minors. So um, it is a, uh, it, and then with the, the law, the regional law, always, uh, always regional law 37 of 2013, the name of the office actually changed into the, the one I mentioned before, but it also changed a little bit the structure of the office, which now deals not only with the minors' rights, but also with the rights of people in jail and with the rights of people, of common people, trying to communicate with the public administration. In terms of minor, what was the, uh, let's say, the big revolution about uh, the project of um, minors dealt by uh, l'ufficio del pubblico tutore dei minori was to understand that every minor, uh, in order to fulfill somehow also the um, the principles of the convention of the minors had to have a sort of a representative or a guardian, let's say, that was a sort of one-to-one. -one. So before uh, the project of Publico Tutore dei Minori, the, the guardianship was a sort of an institutional guardianship. So it normally dealt with the fact that the mayor of a municipality or the chief in charge of the social services would take up uh, one, ten, a uh, hundred guardianships of minors, which did not give exactly the way to the minors to express themselves and to be able to be listened to. So the, the big idea of uh, the office I'm working with was to um, commute the so-called public uh, um, guardianship into a sort of a voluntary guardianship, which was also meaning to be a, a sort of a work with, the, uh, with society. It was a sort of beginning of considering uh, uh, the taking care of minors as a sort of a social responsibility that could be somehow split and uh, uh, divided into more subjects, so one of which was the most important, let's say, in terms of dialogue with the minor, the guardian. So now there is a system of uh, voluntary guardians um, and there, it has been created a system in which uh, several uh, uh, parts uh, of the net uh, of protection of uh, minors uh, have to, uh, to talk to each other. Uh, just to make an example, the, um, the authority, the, the, the court, let's say either the minor's court or the ordinary court that open a file of guardianship for a minor uh, does not uh, decide anymore uh, autom automatically to name a guardian, but sends a request to the office and the office then after the request sends uh, to the social service in the territory in which the minor is located, the, the request of individuating a guardian that could fit that minor. Meaning that, for instance, if we deal with a, a not accompanied minor, it would be better to find a guardian that has time to develop a relationship or has time to teach uh, him uh, Italian, for instance, which is the, 
the privileged means of achieving our rights, the, 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 the fact that one can speak properly a language, or if uh, there is, a, let's say, a medical problem, the social um, service would suggest a, a guardian that could cope with medical problems. This is uh, just a little example of uh, uh, the attention uh, through which we try to attribute to every minor the best uh, guardian in order to be able to protect his interests and rights. Then the, the office of the public, uh, let's say, Publico Tutore dei Minori nowadays, the Garante Diritti della Persona, deals also with spreading the uh, idea and the sensibilization on uh, children's rights. And then uh, it's uh, an office that has got a, a big independence and to which everybody can appeal in order to either solve some problems in the net in which they're in or to uh, make a sort of a, a signal and to explain that there could be problems to be solved always referred to uh, minors. The office actually has have been also a great satisfaction in realizing that the national law number 47 of 2017 that has tried to build a sort of a, an integrated system in dealing with not accompanied minors has introduced as compulsory the system of voluntary guardianships, which mean that now every not accompanied minor has to have a guardian, but this guardian has to be chosen in a list that is deposited at the minor's courts. And it's a list of guardians that have been formed by all the ombudsmen, uh, ombudspersons of uh, um, the several regions in Italy that have among their duties uh, the task of uh, finding, forming, following, uh, and answering to their request uh, the voluntary guardians. This is so another field in which uh, the, the Office uh, of Garante Diritti della Persona in Veneto deals with, uh, which is uh, forming voluntary guardians. Uh, uh, according also to the territory, uh, ter territorial realities uh, in which everybody is uh, located. So normally we uh, organize, uh, and this is uh, where also Paolo De Stefani has uh, collaborated, uh, we organize uh, classes and let's say courses of, uh, um, in order to form these voluntary guardians, because there is also a very uh, big uh, sensation that although they are voluntary people, I mean, they are people that are not paid to be guardians, uh, dedicate their free time to these minors uh, uh, to which they are appointed, but at the same time, they deal with technical things. They deal with uh, uh, judges, uh, they deal with laws, they deal with obligations uh, uh, that the law forces uh, in order to be a good guardian. And moreover, they deal as a sort of a balance uh, in between uh, the, the, all the various parts of the net of protection of the minors, which is not easy at all. As Daria Panebianco said, there are several problems in dealing with the, um, problems around minors. There are lacks of uh, uh, money in order to fulfill all the obligation we should fulfill. And there has been also a very big difficulty in making social services accept the, um, the figure, let's say, the, 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 the personality, the person of the guardian because at the beginning it was, uh, uh, it was safer for them to have a sort of an institutional guardian because the guardian would not complain about how they dealt with problems, would not say anything because actually the guardian was the social service. 
the fact that a new subject was introduced in this very complicated net of protection of minors has at the beginning, and also we could also say now, created some problems. The problem was solved or has tried to be solved by communicating, by increasing the capacity of all the people working around minors to communicate and to really make the other understand exactly which is the task that everybody has to fulfill. And it is only through this way of dealing that we could achieve the main objective, which is the so-called superior interest of minors. In the idea of uh, um, protecting the, my, uh, the, the, the rights of minors, uh, the office deals also with what we call vigilanza, vigilancy. Is, I don't know whether the word is uh, correct, but the, uh, the office can also check, for instance, on communities that host minors. Some communities have been closed due to the intervention of the Office of the Garante dei Diritti della Persona because that community would not achieve the minimum standards that the laws foresee for hosting people. So while we're talking about also, uh, Dr. Panebianco mentioned that uh, the, the system of the protection of migrating uh, minors, Ciproimi, is uh, a very complicated system, but in any case, the standard and the, the minimum standards of welcoming of these minors have to be uh, somehow uh, fulfilled and respected. So this is another task, the task that the law has put on the shoulders, let's say, of the office. And um, office to, to which, as I said, everybody could uh, uh, approach. Anybody, included minors, could uh, send an email or call and uh, uh, ask for uh, either information or uh, help in dealing with whatever the, the task uh, is. And uh, there is also the possibility for families or even uh, in the end, uh, of course, social services to um, accede to the office in order to open cases uh, to be solved. Um, okay, I think that more or less this is the uh, general idea about this office, which, uh, in my opinion, should be somehow also implemented, should be made uh, bigger, uh, especially because it's, uh, it is uh, an independent institution. So this independency, this uh, uh, capacity of dealing with other institutions that apparently are not so independent, uh, like regional governments or also courts uh, or whatever, should really be a means uh, uh, through which minors could really get to achieve uh, the maximum of the protection they are entitled to have. So this is, uh, in my opinion, the most important thing, also because it's an office that could work somehow without all the formalities that necessarily are very linked to other kinds of uh, institutions. So quickness, uh, informality, and a sort of hum humanity in dealing with uh, all, the, the, all the things that are brought to the office uh, are really a sort of a distinction sign in comparison with other institutions that deal with, let's say, the same object. So I stop, and if there are any questions, I'm, I'm here. Thank you very much, Francesca. So now the group is uh, reduced because Daria had to, to move for another commitment. Um, well, we can, uh, I don't know, open a little bit the floor now if there is any comments or remarks. Uh, now we have seen, uh, you know, the whole, uh, let's say, uh, gamut of uh, actors, uh, kind of policies, uh, uh, issues that regards, uh, you know, children's rights implementation uh, 
nationwide, Europe-wide, and also local-wide, I mean, in, in the region of, of Veneto. Have you considered what the government can do also in connection with the, the EU institutions, the commissions, and so on? Uh, what uh, this, the, the um, public services uh, do in um, many areas, uh, from education to health, uh, uh, social issues, and so on. Uh, and also have considered the role of uh, this independent ad hoc uh, uh, institution, which is the, the, the ombudsman, let's say, of this kind of ombudsman for children. Um, maybe uh, we also heard that the, the voice of uh, families, uh, mothers, uh, fathers, etc., involved in this, uh, these mechanisms, uh, whether they are satisfied or not. Um, maybe what is lacking, but this was, I mean, the... the, the 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 the, uh, the frame of the research uh, is the direct uh, you know voice of of children uh, but i think that comprehensively i mean all together all these uh, uh, actors that are you know being given voice uh, in this research and also in this uh, conversation we had today uh, are quite well equipped uh, to convey also the uh, the voice, uh, the needs, uh, the, the, the rights uh, of, of children. Um, if I may, uh, just to make a small remark, uh, just to open the floor in case uh, to other comments, um, I think that uh, uh, the diversification of uh, roles uh, of actors uh, is an added value, especially if those actors really interpret their role in a independent way so they do not uh, you know create uh, unnatural alliances between uh, you know i don't know ngos and the, the public sector for example or uh, um, uh, independent actors uh, like ombudsman and so on and uh, courts governments etc uh, etc et if everybody respects its uh, autonomy and its independence and its role um, things uh, even if complex can can work um, the problem sometimes is that maybe the uh, the texture, the, the the frame is over complicated, and uh, one of the issues that was mentioned at the beginning, I think, uh, also in the intervention of uh, um, of Matteo, and also in the from the viewpoint of uh, Ferrante, so the fact that there is this mismatch between uh, excellent uh, legislation that we have rules, soft law, etc., which is uh, very, you know, advanced. And sometimes poor implementation. Uh, I think they have, we have to revise a little bit of this to think, because excellent uh, norms that cannot be implemented uh, maybe means that they are not uh, taking stock, they are not uh, looking realistically of, on the resources, on the subjects they, they are you know, uh, uh, address too. Um, and so also the, 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 the qualification of those uh, provisions as uh, excellent or optimal, et cetera, should be revised a little bit. <laughs> because if there is such a gap, uh, and this gap is sort of increasing because uh, norms are going more and more, <laughs> you know, uh, enlightened uh, and uh, progressive and so on, but reality, you know, struggle to 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 keep pace not to keep pace uh, with this uh, development uh, probably we have to a little bit to think about if uh, really we are uh, uh, working on the basis of uh, uh, information data the real uh, you know analysis of what is going on in the field uh, or we are just uh, you know moving around and catch up with uh, the last uh, you know uh, buzzwords, uh, uh, also in international discourse uh, and so on, and um, uh, you know, lacking lacking ties with uh, reality. Okay, so. Um, if there is no special comments uh, or remarks, uh, I, 
I thank uh, all the presenters of today. So the ones who remained now, uh, Arianna, Francesca and Matteo, of course, for their presentations. These uh, presentations have been recorded. I think they, they may represent a good contribution to the research uh, done under this, uh, this project that today was uh, sort of uh, wrapped up. And um, well, thank you again. Have a good afternoon and, uh, and see you around. Goodbye. I Goodbye, ask uh, I ask Giulio maybe to 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 close the connection and uh, thank him for uh, his uh, support. Thank you, and uh, I I stop the recording so we can leave and uh, see you next time. Bye bye. Ciao. 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 Ciao.